Here. Council Member Grimes. Here. Council Member Mayo. Here. Council Member Schultz. Here. Council Member Siemens. Present. Council Member Snipper. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Mayo is joining us via telephone, and I think we're going to have about three meetings in a row where we're missing one council member and each one in turn is going to be joining us remotely and so I will try and always remember to uh, call on council member mail for his uh, vote or his comment but if I don't he's free to holler and go hey remember me Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> um, just a couple of uh, quick reminders on upcoming agendas um, we're going to be having a budget work session this Thursday, May 3rd. Next Monday, May 7th, is Ward 5 night and budget session reconciliation. Uh, Monday the 14th, we have scheduled first reading ordinance adopting the FY13 tax rate, stormwater management budget, and budget. And the f following... Monday the 21st is second reading and we need to hold that schedule because of various deadlines on, on what we have to uh, get the tax rate to the county. Um, Wednesday, May 16th is the City Council tour of Tacoma Junction from 6.30 to 8.30 and Thursday, May 24th is the City Council tree canopy tour, 6.30 to 8.30. So that's upcoming agenda items of note in May. Um, <clears throat> The next item is uh, public comment period for anybody who would like to make any comments. A reminder that we have two public hearings scheduled for this evening, the constant yield tax rate, tax rate public hearing and the public hearing on the FY13 budget. So if you're here to speak on either of those items, please wait till we get to those public hearings. Public comment period is for anything not those two items. So is there anybody who has comments? Heather. That's all right. Go ahead. We'll get, we'll, we'll get to him next. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Heather Hurlbert from 211 Manor Circle, and I wanted to speak to you with respect to the proposal that you make a resolution on the um, de detention provisions of terrorist suspects under the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, in my day job, when I'm not being a Tacoma mom, I run the National Security Network, which works on teaching progressives how not to be afraid to talk about national security issues at the national level. So um, I have a very keen professional interest in this issue. And the reason that I'm, um, I felt like one of the most useful things I could do for my day job was come and, and ask my community to get involved is because, frankly, we're at this moment right now where federal level legislators and, in fact, um, our military establishment and our intelligence establishment and even the FBI do not want to see our justice system militarized, do not want to see the tool of civilian trials taken out of their hands, and don't want to see in the world the U.S. Constitution weakened. So there's this amazing moment of agreement among activists on the left, activists on the right, and, in fact, our military. There's also this moment where our federal level legislators are not convinced that there is this kind of local support for constitutional principles and the rights of, of civilians. So this is a moment where an action like this, particularly if twinned by actions that have been taken by libertarian and conservative groups in Colorado, in Arizona, in Virginia, can have real impact at the federal level. So um, as someone who's whose regular line of work is at the federal level and not the local level, there's really rarely been a better time to have a local resolution that could actually really have some impact both with our state delegation, uh, where frankly we had one senator whose position was a little disappointing and it would be great for her to hear from her from her local uh, constituents and also at, at, to, at the broader federal level to really make the point that um, this is not this is not a position that Americans feel comfortable with and want to see go uncorrected. So um, thank you very much for uh, making me come out to the City Council for the first time and be a proud resident of Tacoma Park. All right. Thank you. Mr. Loveless. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Pat Loveless, <coughs> 7620 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park, Ward 4, your official police delegate. One thing I want to tell everybody tonight is I thank the city of Tacoma Park for the putting on the Azalea Awards uh, the other night, Saturday night. 
It was so wonderful. The music was wonderful. The awards were wonderful. And it's so good to see other activists in Tacoma Park getting honored. I really love to see that. I want to thank you for giving Joyce Siemens the award for Superhero. There's no one I could see more fitting for that because she helps us all at the Franklin Apartments. And she helps us all around the city. She cares about our seniors and our disabled. She brings a man of food package over and she does other events for us. And I want to thank Joyce Siemens for the work she's done. She's the mother of Tacoma Park, the angel of Tacoma Park. We've got to remember that no one is more deserving of getting the award than she has. And also, I also want to let you people know that something is coming up in a couple of days, and I think the city should be aware of it. And I want everybody to sing happy birthday to Terry Siemens, who is turning 66 on Wednesday, May the 2nd. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Terry. Happy birthday to you. We love you, Terry. You're the best uh, councilman for Ward 4. You're my favorite one. I want to thank you for everything you've done for me, Terry. Terry, I want to thank you for everything you've done for me to come and visit me at the hospitals when I was in there. And when I, was, uh, and when I can't get around, you bring me to the meetings. I really appreciate that, Terry. And you help me out sometimes when I'm at home. You help me out with my oxygen. I really appreciate it. And I think everybody should be appreciative of their councilmen, and they should vote conscientiously when they do. Because uh, we have, we, we've had uh, really good uh, success in our ward since uh, Terry's been elected. And Because we get Joyce with him, remember. We get two for the price of one. And I really appreciate you people for doing what you can for our city. And also... I'd like to see everybody reconsider their thoughts on the, uh, on the uh, Fund Our Communities uh, resolution. I would like to see that pass through because I am so much against that war. I want to bring our dollar bills home as well as our troops home safe and sound because people like me would probably benefit a lot easier if uh, we had those dollars taken away from that war and put toward medical research and put toward our, our uh, medical needs and our educational needs in our communities and our food. We really need that money brought home. So stop feeding the Pentagon. Bring our dollars home. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll point out uh, that uh, Councilmember Siemens' face got about as red as his tie. Oh, come <laughs> on. He's not embarrassed, is he? Yes, he, yes, he was. He was. Well, we, your time's up, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I hope we've reached the conclusion of the uh, singing happy birthday. We've had two in the last couple of weeks. Really? We had uh... Yes. Uh, somebody else. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Jean Athey. Hi, Seth. Um, and uh, I am actually not a resident of Tacoma Park, but I am the uh, chair of Peace Action Montgomery. We have over 200 um, members in uh, Tacoma Park, and I'm also the uh, chair of the Fund Our Communities Bring the War Dollars Home Coalition, which has now 60 organizations across the state in Maryland as a part of the coalition, and many uh, Tacoma Park residents um, are, are members of organizations that are in our coalition. So I hope it's okay for me to speak, even though I don't live in Tacoma sure. Park. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I live in Brookville. Um, so I, I was hoping to be able to show you some, um, some charts uh, on a computer but since that isn't possible, I have handouts for you, and I'm just, I just want to go through the handouts. The first one that um, has this pie chart, it shows the President's discretionary budget for 2013, and as you can see, with the, the, the blue part is the amount that goes to military spending, and if you combine that with the um, veterans' benefits, which many people think should also be considered part of military, that means that... Um, 62% of the discretionary budget is going to the military, which is an astonishing amount. 
Um, I would like to draw your attention to the next chart, the one that looks like this, which compares U.S. military spending um, with that of other countries in rank order. And as you can see, our own military spending is, is ex ex way out of line with other countries. Um, and I want to point out that, that both of these charts are looking at only at military spending that's in the Pentagon, there is a lot of other military spending that really, that, that is not in the Pentagon. For example, uh, nuclear weapons is the Department of, of Energy. Um, the CIA is inclu included in this. One person did an analysis last year and uh, suggested that actually our military spending is about double that. Um, the next chart I think is very interesting. This is one from a paper done at the Cato Institute, and it shows um, per capita uh, defense expenditures, that is our taxes, how much we pay in taxes for the military combined with other countries in the world. Um, and so the first, uh, the first line on the left, bar on the left, is U.S. Uh, taxes going to military spending, and then you see NATO without the U.S., not, not including the U.S., Russia, and so forth. And again, um, so, so much of our taxes goes to the military that we have nothing, very little left over. The, the next chart um, that is a, a line chart shows military spending from World War II to the, to the current date. The reason that there's a blue line there is that you may be aware that um, uh, starting in about uh, 2001, um, spending for the wars was separated out from the base Pentagon budget. So really, the Pentagon budget should be the, 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 line, the blue line. And as, as you can see from this chart, the, um, we, we are now spending more on the military than we did during the Vietnam War, during the Cold War, during the Korean War, and almost as much as we did during World War II, and that's in, in constant dollars. Um, and if you can wrap up your comments. Big pardon? If you can wrap up your comments. Okay. Um, I do have uh, some other slides here that I hope you'll look at, which shows how Tacoma um, Park residents' uh, money could be spent uh, if we had a reprioritization of our funding. And I, and I just want to say that um, from my own point of view, I think that we are, our nation is in a very critical stage right now. When a lot of times you look back on a historical period and you don't, at, at the time you're living through it, you don't understand what's going on. We have, a, we have a period of time when we have an extraordinary amount of money going to the military. We have laws that, like the um, NDAA, uh, I, personally I thought that we had settled this issue in the 12th century with the Magna Carta of indefinite detention, and it seems like we're revisiting it. Um, we have uh, so much money going to, no, no, to politics that, that uh, we have a totally corrupt system. One last comment. I was talking with my, my grandson about some of this um, a week or so ago, and um, I was explaining this to him, and he said, but why aren't the grown-ups doing something? And that's what we need to be doing something about all of these problems. They are critical problems for the future of our country and for my grandson. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the helpful information. Anybody else? Good evening. Uh, my name is Melissa Goman. I'm the Legislative Director for the ACLU of Maryland, and I appreciate this opportunity. We're here to endorse the resolution against the NDAA, and we do, um, we are a statewide organization, but we do have our field office on Carroll Avenue in Tacoma Park, and we have several hundred members that are Tacoma Park residents. So um, I'd just like to point out a few things. We did file some written comments. One thing we think is important is that we believe this is really a historic threat. Um, it codifies the indefinite military detention of citizens and non-citizens, non and they can be very far from battlefield. They don't have to be um, engaged in combat. And there are even um, some that believe it would authorize that within the United States itself. So we feel this is a very dangerous threat. Um, to the citizens and to all residents of our country. And while the national ACLU is working to ask Congress to repeal the act, we really, really feel that more needs to be done. And that's why it's one of our priorities to ask communities across the country to file these types of resolutions. And I included in my public comments all the states and communities that have done so so far. We have Arizona, Maine, and Virginia are states that have passed these resolutions. And there are a number of cities and counties from 
California to Colorado, Massachusetts, North Carolina, so really all <coughs> spectrums of the, the country and all political spectrums. And we feel that this will make um, an important and a strong statement to Congress if we can get many communities to do this. So I, I hope that you will consider it and that you will um, pass this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, even though I introduced the uh, Bring the War Home, Bring the War Dollars Home. If you could just remind everybody who you are. Please. Yeah, I never really spoke on it, I, and I did say something more about uh, issues of obesity and, and having some interest in what kind of food is served in Tacoma Park events. But I, I did want to say one of the reasons we moved here as a family some 25 years ago, because we knew that Tacoma Park was interested in issues beyond its border. Uh, after all, there isn't much of the Burmese population here, uh, and there, there's no nuclear regu there's no nuclear reactor that I know of. Well, there might be something in the in the hospital. I don't know, but but these we moved here, and a lot of people in Tacoma Park. I'm going to say the masses of people moved here because Tacoma Park cares about issues beyond its borders, and. In a way, this issue has brought up something very interesting because a lot of times when you run, the issues are kind of, you're all the same. There's not much controversy. And I know in the case of, of uh, a War II, we thought both candidates were progressive. We didn't see much difference. But now something surfaced. And the question is, and I think it's a new issue, should Tacoma Park and its elected officials remain silent in the face of unnecessary slaughter, wasteful resources, wasteful manpower. We all protest when there's an opportunity. We all speak to our Congress people. We vote on that basis. We see them. But we expect you to represent us, not to remain quiet, not to remain silent. It's simply not an option. And finally, I have to say, and I'm not going to be too specific here, but as a Jewish person, I think of past opportunities where liberals, once they had an opportunity, could have spoken up, but for reasons kept silent and said nothing, while in the end people, whether it was Jews or other people, died as a, as a result of their silence. I think we have an obligation to speak up in the face of uh, moral ugliness beyond our borders and and urge you to do so. Thank you. Thanks. And Mike, can you please, Mike, just identify yourself for the uh, Mike Tabor, 706 Erie Avenue, Tacoma Park. Thanks. Uh, Wally Malikoff, 8022 Maple Avenue. Um, I've been a resident of Ward 5 for 16 years. I want to first thank you all for your time on the council. Special thanks to Ruben for his time on the council as well. Um, I appreciate the hard work that you've done. Um, I, I'm here to address the two resolutions uh, that residents have urged the council to pass. The, the redirection of military spending to domestic needs and the uh, second, the resolution urging the repeal of National Defense Authorization Act. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what the proper role of the council should be. I realize that this is not in the traditional province of the council. Um, I realize that you have a lot of work to do. Um, I talked to Kay Daniels uh, about, uh, just to get a little background about the council and how you operate, and I attended also the, um, the uh, forum last week that, the, um, that was held on the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and um, so in, 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 in sort of um, putting this in perspective, um, there's another perspective. I think that I and most of the, I won't age anyone here, but most of the, um, the members of the council are of, of the same generation. Um, and when we were involved in some way in the civil rights movement, uh, an anti-war movement, uh, peace demonstration, environmental movement, women's movement, gay rights. Um, and when you think about what our country was like less than 50 years ago, uh, Blair, where Kay and I went in, uh, in the 60s, uh, was essentially segregated. Um, apartments and neighborhoods would not rent to African Americans. Where I grew up in Oakview and Silver Spring, when African Americans uh, first moved into the neighborhood, they tried to keep the pool all white. Gays were considered criminals in our schools and our communities. 
Um, and I think we're rightly proud uh, of the role that we played in those movements. Um, and I think that when big issues came before us, we used every avenue that we could think of to raise our voices. Um, we put the issues before the American people in any way we could. We even raised a ruckus. Um, and to me, that's what Tacoma Park has always been about, uh, taking our role as concerned activist citizens seriously, raising issues in debate, uh, such as by having our local government pass resolutions on the nuclear free zone, impeaching George Bush, protesting U.S. Uh, Anti-Patriot Act. I remember in the 60s uh, when I visited my aunt and uncle uh, who lived on Holly Avenue here in Tacoma Park, uh, they were very active in the, uh, uh, they were very active in the uh, fight against the North Central Freeway. Um, and I remember them explaining to me, he said, this is what concerned citizens do, and this is what we do in Tacoma Park to save our community. Um, so the question is, where is the sense of activism now? Um, certainly the issues raised in these resolutions, excessive military spending, uh, that's bleeding our local governments and neighborhoods, bypassing the judicial court system for military tribunals, are real dangers to our nation, our community. Um, I understand that you have lots of uh, burdens here. But I'm not asking you to spend all your time on, the, on these national issues, but I'm asking to please maintain a sense of the Tacoma Park spirit. Uh, other local jurisdictions are speaking up. I'm asking you to, to add Tacoma, voices, Tacoma Park's voice to the, um, to the dissent. Um, and really, as people have said, other jurisdictions are doing it. If not now, when? Uh, thanks for your time and your consideration. Um, I have um, a written statement. Should I submit that? Sometime? Sure. Okay, I'm happy to take it. Thanks very much. Hello, my name is John Spears. I live at 819 Davis Avenue. And I have a comment about traffic calming measures in the, between the creeks area. Is this the appropriate time? Yes. For that comment? Okay. In January, we sent a, the Neighborhood Association sent a letter to the city urging uh, four-way stops and raised intersections at several areas. Uh, one of those is intersection of Central and Davis Avenues near where I live. <coughs> Just wanted to uh, urge, um, find out what the ways to move forward with that and say that, you know, I think it's something that uh, is a safety concern, both as for traffic <coughs> because it's a sort of a blind intersection and also because of the large number of children that are now living at that intersection. Um, I counted now there are 11 children that live there under the age of six, and just a few years ago there were very few. This is one of the few intersections that does not have a four-way stop in that area. And we found that in areas just further down the street, near Central and Jackson, where there is a stop sign and speed bumps, the situation is, is much safer for children and I'd like to see what we could do to put in a, a raised intersection and stop sign at that intersection and others that we mentioned in the letter. I'm sorry I thought others were going to be here. I don't have a, a full list of what was uh, proposed. But thanks um, for taking Thank you. Um, can we just get a update on where that is in that Yes, I had uh, sent Mr. Spears an email last week. Hopefully he received it, just apologizing for the delay. Obviously, it's been a challenging time for the staff time-wise with the, with the budget. I do have the staff's comments on that, and I just need to spend some time reviewing those. Okay. So something will be forthcoming soon on that. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Steve Shapiro, Willow Avenue, and I just as soon spend my Monday evening at home rather than here, but I thank you all for your work and your service. But what, what brought me out is to speak in favor of the council supporting and passing a resolution for redistribution of military spending to domestic needs. Even if Tacoma Park were not a progressive community, it's in the interest of our cities, our towns, our counties, and our states uh, to get the resources to do the things that make our country great and our, our society great. We are hurting with um, this behemoth of uh, military spending to the degree it is. Even if one is a large supporter of the military role that the United States plays across the world, 
it, it really, our, our society and our country is hurting bad, bad, bad. Um, I know that other localities have been passing similar resolutions, and while it's nice to see Tacoma Park in the vanguard, my biggest concern is that we not be left in the dust. Um, and I could talk facts, figures, and eloquent words, but it's really not necessary. It's really in our pragmatic interest to do the right thing for our society and for our city. Thank you again for your service. Thank you. Hello, I am Chrysantha Rice from Houston Avenue. Um, and I wrote down notes so I don't ramble angrily. Um, but like some others before me, um, I'm here in support of, of a resolution to repeal the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, because a piece of legislation that involves the military in these very civilian affairs um, that suspends the right of habeas corpus um, for any and everyone is a large and very scary step in the direction of authoritarianism. And uh, if Tacoma Park can give it some bad press, um, I think we should do so. Thank you. Thank you. Evening. Uh, I'm Cyrus Nomadi of 806 Houston Avenue. Uh, you've heard a number of people speak tonight uh, urging you to uh, pass a resolution in favor of uh, um, repeal of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. Um, so you know that there are people who are here who are not very big fans of it. I did want to bring to light a little bit more information about why this would be a very good idea. Um, most of the provisions that people are so upset about um, were happened very quietly. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act has been around for a while. It's passed every year. But this, these indefinite, pretend, indefinite detention provisions were introduced just in this 2000 version of the, 2012 version of the bill. They, passed, uh, they were added into the bill very quietly. Obama somewhat loudly said that he was going to re uh, veto the bill if it came across his desk. And very quietly, he signed it into law. These are deeply unpopular provisions with the American people. And I think uh, it would not only be a good thing, but it would be a very risk-free thing for our city council to pass a resolution saying that we don't accept this. Um, so I strongly urge you to do so. And I uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'll be very brief. My name is Erica Meyer, and I am with Compassion Over Killing, and we're just down the street at the Tacoma Business Center. And I wanted to express my sincere gratitude to the city of Tacoma Park for all of its support for Veg Week, which is now a national campaign that we kicked off last week on the 23rd and ended yesterday on the 29th. And uh, every year since we've launched this campaign, Mayor Williams has been incredibly supportive, signing a proclamation. And this year, we had Mayor Williams, along with other council members, join in on the pledge. I've heard feedback from several of you, and it sounds like the week went really well. I'm eager to hear more. And I also want to just say the example that Tacoma Park has set to establish Veg Week here in the city has led to other cities and counties across the country also adopting resolutions and proclamations in support of this initiative, which is designed to reach out to people and let them know that we can make kinder food choices that are healthier for us and also more sustainable for the planet. So thank you so much for your support. And thank you for the uh, goodies. For the uh, Veg Week pledgers, there's some goodies up here. Just for the for us, right? We're not sharing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm Diana Cohn, Jefferson Avenue, here on behalf of Historic Tacoma with a simple announcement to invite everyone to Tacoma Park's 29th annual, 39th mm -hmm. annual House and Garden Tour this coming Sunday, May 6th, from 1 to 5 p.m., it's a self-guided tour, as always, rain or shine. We're hoping for shine. And it features 12 houses in North Tacoma along the railroad tracks, including the residences of Frederick Douglass's daughter, believe it or not, um, mystery writer Martha Grimes, the 2012 Grandmaster named by the Mystery Writers of America, and the azalea cultivator, friend and compatriot of 
Benjamin Morrison, whose name is Frederick Meyer and his Greek revival house is um, worth seeing. The advance tickets are $18 and are still available online at historictacoma.org. And on the day of the tour, the tickets will rise to $20 and they will be available at Tour Central, which is Upper Portal Park at the edge of North Tacoma on Piney Branch Road and Tacoma Avenue. We hope to see you there. And I thank Councilperson Grimes and Williams and Kay, who have already purchased their tickets. And we hope to see more people from Tacoma Park there. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi, Terry. Hello. Uh, Maxine Hillary, Sligo Creek Parkway. Proud contributor to Compassion Over Killing. A um, couple quick things for this agenda. One, um, you know, I haven't been around much, been on travel, etc. But um, when Diesel, our police dog, passed away, I got a cake and brought it over to the police department because I love that dog and believe wholeheartedly in what animals can do to better human kind. And I wondered, and, and if I am, you know, uh, unnecessarily speaking, stop me now so I don't waste a lot of time. If anybody had thought of putting up a statue or doing some sort of commemoration, I know that Officer Atwell was crushed, and I know he, uh, Diesel, actually had come to my house at one point in the build of my house and, and had, you know, was brave enough to go through it. So I wanted to propose that perhaps we do do something to remember Diesel by. It would mean a lot to the police department and uh, to Officer Atwell. I don't know if they're, you know, something that when you rolled by the police department, you could see, you know, our dog. So, um, yeah, he was cool. He was really cool. Uh, and there's just one thing that came to mind when the other gentleman, when several people were speaking, and I have to qualify this, that yes, I contribute to compassion over killing in many animal groups. I'm bicultural, Jewish, and American Indian, and we know all about genocide, and we know all about racism. And um, that said, when we make the assumptions, we use the word progressive here in Tacoma Park. Well, that's a loaded term because, you know, I live in Ward 5, and I live in the part of Ward 5, and, I, and this is not to be offensive, but to be honest, I look at my city council here, nobody looks like me or my neighbors. My neighbors are black and Hispanic. And we talk about diversity in Tacoma Park, and we talk about progressiveness in Tacoma Park, and I ask you, you know, why is my ward not included? We're, we're barely there. And, you know, so when I start to look about this notion, it's almost as if you say you don't support something progressive around here, you're a pariah. If you ask questions about spending or public spending or other things, you, you know, there's this idea that you're either on this side or on this side, but we don't have a lot of room in the middle around here. And to me, progressive and tolerance means, you know, God forbid somebody should be a Republican, which I am not. I'm a proud independent. But, you know, God forbid you should be a Republican here. You're a scary, you're an outcast. And there are Republicans who live here who are animal lovers and care about the environment. You know, so the notion that genocide is, you know, that somehow only the progressives care about genocide or only care about military spending is wrong. You know, we need to... to in, Diversity is not just about race, it's about opinion, it's about everything. So bring us in, all of us. You know, even if we disagree and hash it out and, you know, sling tomatoes at each other. But let's be what we claim to be or shut up. Thank you. Thank Happy you. birthday, Terry. Thank you. And, and you have a chance to change the appearance of this council because yeah, the Lord 5C will be vacant soon. Well, I know a really good candidate. Well, they might look like they might look like you. <laughs> yeah, right. But that's okay. I think he thinks a little more like I do. Also, I'm better at support role. Hi, my name is Thomas Nephew. Um, I'm from I live on Birch Avenue here in Tacoma Park. 
Um, I return tonight with a growing list of Tacoma Park residents supporting our NDAA resolution. Last week there were 104 names. This week there are 155. I also want to report what a great success the NDAA forum was uh, and thank council members Daniels Cohen and Grimes for uh, joining us. I emailed Mayor Williams links to a complete video playlist of the uh, forum so you can all see it as well as uh, links to summaries of the points made by the two panelists, Ms. Hurlbert, who, whom you've heard from, and Shahid Buttar of the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. I, I want to take note of something Councilmember Grimes said during the forum, uh, in which he spoke of the uh, proverbial drunk looking for his lost keys under the lamppost, because that's where the light is. Now, I know he didn't mean we were the drunks, uh, uh, but my point is rather that we're not looking for a door key we dropped, whether by mistake or in some kind of stupor. And the city council isn't a motionless lamppost either. Uh, we're looking for help from our city council, a spotlight, so to speak, to regain the rights someone else swatted out of our hands and into the dark. A public city council resolution, publicly deliberated, could shine that spotlight in a way no personal protest or no ever could. Some continue to take the view that non-city issues aren't proper subjects of official council concern. My answer is not if the city charter and municipal code are any guide. The charter states unambiguously that the city council's powers in quote include but are not limited to legislation to sponsor, promote, and otherwise advance legislation at any level including county, state, and federal and to expend funds and resources for the same on behalf of the welfare and happiness of the citizens and residents. Likewise, the municipal code provides for precisely the kind of simple resolution we're proposing. Ours is a resolution and a strategy that's been vetted by some of the best legal minds and civil liberties advocates in the country. It's endorsed by the ACLU of Maryland and the Bill of Rights Defense Committee and the De Defending Dissent Foundation and South, Am South Asian Americans leading together. We've demonstrated community support with 155 signatures and comments before council. We haven't for a minute taken anybody's support for granted, whether the councils or the communities. We've distributed flyers, flyers like these, maintained a website, held a forum to explain what we're concerned about. We've demonstrated that this resolution isn't an isolated occurrence, but part of a nationwide effort by leading civil liberties advocacy groups. The NDAA is a huge assault on due process, the rule of law, and civil liberties as we've known them. I'm pleading for Tacoma Park to stand tall against it. And I, again, respectfully ask Mayor Williams to place this resolution on the council agenda. And I have the list and uh, the kind of handouts we've been passing around. Thanks very much. Thank you for returning. Thank you for your comments, and thank you for your work on this. Anybody else? Okay, um, we will move on to council comments. Council member Snipper. Wow. <clears throat> well, I have a just a brief uh, reminder for folks in Ward 5. Um, next week is Ward 5 night, and I hope everyone will come out and um, support Ward 5. Come out at uh, 7 o'clock and um, talk about your issues, meet the council, if you have particular concerns, um, share them with us. Thank you. And I hope to see you next week. Council Member Daniels Cohen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not going to be quite as brief as Council Member um, Sniffer, sorry. Um, first, I, I really want to thank everyone who came here tonight and, and spoke in front of the Council. I, I'm thrilled to see this many people. Uh, this passionate about about these issues it, it it just it warms my heart so keep coming keep on coming back I think that everyone may not agree with me but I'm loving it uh, but tonight I'm going to continue my verbal I think I use the word virtual tour of the junction but it isn't virtual it's a verbal tour of the junction to tell you about the newest kid on the block and that's the green commuter um, I met Joe Rias who's the owner in um, I guess March of uh, 2010 at a Tacoma Business um, 
uh, an old Tacoma Business Association marketing meeting, and he was just checking us out. He wanted to see uh, where he should land his newly designed business. And in spite of meeting me, he landed in the junction and, and uh, opened the green commuter on April 16th, 2010, where he's been su successfully for the last two years. Whilst you want to think he isn't another niche uh, business, it is indeed because while he does a whale of a business in bicycle sales and service, he also specializes in electric and cargo bicycles. And that's uh, his claim to fame. And there are not too many of those kinds of businesses in the biking world around. And of course, it doesn't come as a, uh, a surprise. This is bike month for sure. So I, I brought him up. Uh, he had, become a, had been a mechanic for Ferrari of Washington for 25 years with a passion for bike riding and decided to forge out on, a, on his own. Stop by his store any day but Monday. He's closed on Mondays. Check out the excellent product and the fabulous customer service uh, from an, another junction niche business. I, I keep saying they're niche businesses. They're not, they, they don't offer services to the world. They have specific services that, that, that are theirs and theirs alone. Uh, just a little bit more about Joe Riaz. I think if any of you all have been to any of the festivals in the last two years, you will have seen him at every one. He's got his business there or he's there personally. I, I actually bumped into him at uh, Gear Up Tacoma program this past Saturday. And he is among the many treasures at Tacoma Park. He is one that's, that's really moved here and is quite outstanding. So, now, all that said, on to gold stars. Some weeks there are so many I should leave them alone, but I'm not going to. I've got to give gold stars to Gear Up Tacoma, and that would be uh, uh, Officer Carla Magne, Lucy Neer, uh, plus a lot of other police support. They were, there were people on a not the most beautiful Saturday in the East Coast down, uh, down behind the building here uh, doing their bike practicing, and there were people from all ages. Bikes for the World probably took in at least 25 trade-ins where they renovate the bike and they then give it to someone who's in need of it and probably someone in another country. Uh, more gold stars, more gold stars to the nationwide prescription drug take-back day. Try and say that fast. A bunch of folks are really reading their newsletter because the police filled up probably five, at least five 40-gallon trash bags with drugs that were, were uh, that people were just going to throw down the toilet. So that's, that's a pretty exciting thing. And just this came today. It, maybe all of you all read it, and that's why you're here tonight. But this is your Tacoma Park newsletter. It's a show and tell. It's, read it. It's got everything in the world that you need to know about Tacoma Park on, for any month. Ah, there's more. Gold stars to Tacoma Foundation and Tacoma Voice for the ninth annual Azalea Awards. There are too many people to even begin to mention who had something to do with this program. Not only uh, the people who put it together from the Voice and Tacoma Foundation, but all of the Azalea Award nominees. I congratulate them. I especially congratulate all the winners and all the people that got uh, all the, the groups that got uh, Tacoma uh, Foundation grants. Uh, now, I'm saving the best for last because major gold stars go to Erica Meyer, Executive Director of Compassion Over, over a Killing, for challenging the council to Veg Week. This was a really great experience and quite professionally done. We got a little booster every, every day on how to stay with the program. Hats off to the participant from the city council. That would be our great mayor, Bruce Williams, Seth Grimes, Terry Siemens, Fred Schultz, and me. And we're the only ones who get the cookies. Everybody else doesn't have cookies tonight. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Kidding, joking. But we took the pledge and we vegged out all week. What a really interesting and constant reminder about eating green and healthy, not only for us, but for the animals as well. I'm sure there are many more gold stars to be, out in our, be given out in our fabulous city, but that's it for tonight. And now on to what helps us give out the gold stars, the budget process. Thank you. Sorry, I was really long tonight. It was so much. There's a big week this week. <laughs> Council Member Schultz. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to say that I will, in terms of absences from the City Council, I will not be present for the May 29th meeting. 
So I think that will extend the streak of consecutive meetings of having somebody absent. Okay. And I will be incommunicado. I have no idea where I'm going to be, but I can assure you it isn't going to be anywhere where there's communication. Somewhere in Canada or northwest part of the United States in the mountains. Um, I want to thank everybody who came here tonight to testify on behalf of the, um, the Bring Dollars Home program and the NDAA. When uh, Tom's nephew first came to speak to us on this matter, probably about six weeks ago, something like that, uh, it was his single voice, and I'm just speaking for myself. I didn't know what the NDAA was. Now I do. Um, and I didn't understand much of what was being spoken about. And having one voice is better than zero voices. Uh, but my feeling at that time simply was, well, where's the, what's the context? Where's the army of people? What is this? Uh, how do I figure out how this is, uh, how Tacoma Park is supposed to be effective? And would it be effective, et cetera, if we would if we take an action or something? Over this past several weeks, the numbers have grown, and there is no substitute for warm bodies in a public forum. It's just it's it's uh, it's a truism, and that's what you've accomplished here tonight, and previous and last week as well uh, on this on this question on both of these uh, questions. So I'm, uh, I'm in favor of uh, supporting resolutions on uh, both of these items uh, uh, because I think the case has been well made. And uh, with regard to Veg Week, I I'm pleased to say that I survived Veg Week. I appreciate uh, your, your um, uh, badgering me into this. <laughs> it was good for me. I enjoyed lots of good food this week. I think if anybody was put out, it was probably my wife, who all of a sudden had to figure out some different uh, menus. Um, and it was great to sink my teeth into a liverwurst sandwich this afternoon. <laughs> uh, I even, but it was a sacrifice because I always have bacon on Sunday mornings, and I said nope, no bacon. So. I, there's a little character building going on there. <laughs> so anyway, it was a good thing to do, uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, yes, I'm glad. It was kind of fun, I thought, anyway. Maybe not everybody in my household. So um, that is all I wanted to comment on. Council Member Grimes. Thank you. So my thanks also to everyone who came out to testify tonight, whether it was about the NDAA repeal, or about fund our communities, or about Veg Week, or about traffic calming measures, or anything else, because I know the effort that's involved in coming to a city council meeting uh, to stand at the podium in order to make your views known in three minutes or less, uh, depending on how strict the mayor is that evening. <laughs> so I want to say regarding the two resolutions that have been uh, discussed for several weeks that I am quite happy to talk to anyone about these kind of things, but not right at this moment. I don't think it's the appropriate time. So I'm not hard to find by email or telephone, and I'd invite you to get in touch with me about that, uh, these topics at uh, a different time. Thank you. And I've just got a couple things to mention. Uh, first, let me also thank all of you who came this evening. It's always uh, good to have people come and come and uh, whatever the issue is that you're supportive of or questioning or wondering about or if you're just here for information. Uh, and it's been very heartening to see the amount of support for the proposed resolutions, and I think we will be taking action on those very soon. Um, I want to mention uh, that I was at a, uh, I along with uh, the city manager, the deputy city manager, and the police chief were at the county council this morning. There was a uh, government operations committee meeting about uh, municipal tax duplication. 
and this is an issue that has been very important to people in the city for a long time. It's the method by which the county reimburses the city for the services that the city provides that the county collects taxes for. And there has been a now five-year task force, joint task force by the city and the county, the cities, the 19 municipalities in the county and the county, uh, looking at how the current formulas work or don't work and looking to uh, come up with a uh, re with revised methodology to uh, making sure that the reimbursement to the municipalities is right and fair. Uh, I think this morning we finally got to a point where uh, there is increased recognition by members of the county council, particularly the members of the GO committee, uh, about how this process is broken and how it needs to be fixed. And they committed this morning to uh, returning to this issue in depth after their budget discussions are over, after they have the, uh, the final version of the task force report on municipal tax duplication. And they committed to meeting on these issues in early September uh, so as to get these issues resolved before next year's budget where everybody is again going, gee, I thought we were going to work on this and finish it up by this year, and here we are again in the same position. So uh, I want to thank the city manager and the deputy city manager and the police chief for all the hard work that you put in into this most recent effort, and particularly the city manager for taking on the thankless task of uh, being the municipal co-chair of the task force and I know that you're anticipating being happy that the report is final. Uh, it's, we're not quite there yet, but it's very close. And it was, I think, a, uh, a good effort this morning at uh, making the county council members aware of exactly why this is so important and what the issues are. Um, I wanted to also let people know that uh, Councilmember Schultz and I were at the County Council last week and the uh, Tacoma Langley Sector Plan was finally voted on. That was again about a five-year process and that has been finalized and uh, is now going forward so that will uh, enable the, everybody to know kind of what the revised master plan is for the Tacoma Langley area in anticipation of the Purple Line uh, all of the myriad issues that go on with that. Um, and also, uh, just to let people know that uh, my, my understanding today is that uh, Beverly Swaim Staley, who is the Maryland Department of Transportation Secretary, uh, is resigning effective July 1 and wondering how that might affect any of our ongoing negotiations over uh, State Highway and uh, Flower Avenue and Route 410. So we will. Uh, get further word on what, if any, effect that has on things. And finally, just a reminder to people, one of the things that uh, nobody has mentioned so far of upcoming events is this coming Sunday morning. It's the TKPK 5K Fun Run and Walk. And I'd encourage anybody who's interested. I know that uh, Councilmember Daniels Cohen is one of the walkers of the 5K. You got to beat me. You got to do it. <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a great event with uh, hundreds of people coming out and uh, of all ages, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And I think it starts at 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 a.m. 8, 8 a.m. Sunday morning. <laughs> right out front of the building. Uh, it's electronically timed. You get a little uh, thing to, to wear. And uh, it's a great event. It's been going on for years. And uh, look forward to seeing you there. Um, city manager's comments. I was just going to add on to the mayor's comment about this morning's GO committee meeting. Um, we had requested, I think as some of the council members are already know, that six, roughly $653,000 be placed on the reconciliation list for consideration by the full county council. Um, that request was honored by the GO committee this morning. It is broken into four, three parts, basically, just to provide some flexibility. And would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank the members of the GO committee, which would be Councilmember Navarro, Councilmember Irvin, and Councilmember Reamer for their support. Um, they have been strong supporters of the city of Tacoma Park in the past and certainly strong supporters for municipalities in the area of tax duplication. Thank you. Um, 
We don't have any minutes to adopt this evening, so we will now move to the public hearings. And the first public hearing is the constant yield tax rate public hearing. And we had a sign-up sheet for the two public hearings. We'll start with anybody who signed up on the uh, sign-up sheets, and then we'll take any comments from anybody who wishes to make comments as well. Maxine Hillary, you signed up for the uh, constant yield tax rate public hearing? Of course. <laughs> you know, I used to be a renter. I rented here for over five years. I bought a house. And all of a sudden, uh, I am amazed at what happens to my money. And I ask myself this, why must everything come out of the homeowner? You know, why? And, and I, I see a lot of folks around here who are on fixed incomes and homeowners. Or, you know, we talk about affordable housing. Affordable for who? You know, because even our police officers can't afford to live in Tacoma Park. They can come here and work. Our firefighters can come here and work. And every time I turn around, it, and, and this is a very small amount of money that we're talking about raising here. And I ask myself, what can we cut? We're talking about adding something, you know, adding positions. And I look at this. It's a small amount of money, and it's a small increase. But I know people are on pay freezes. We're seeing our county taxes go up. I mean, at a certain point, I turn around and I say, you know, I, where I live just alone, there are at least three apartment buildings that are for sale. And... The landlords can barely afford to keep them up. We have, you know, so many. We're just out of balance on this. That's where I'm coming from. So, you know, I don't support it. Many people I know don't support it because there's other ways. I mean, what does this cost every year? What does that business thing, that big piece of paper, big thing that comes to your house every year cost? Where, where do we spend our money that we can't save this money somewhere else? What would happen if we asked renters to pay just a smidge, just a little tiny bit of money? We're a city that offers premium education, premium services, and it's all on the back of the homeowner, many of them middle-income homeowners, not families that this is a blip on their radar, but people where this little bit of money really counts, and I'm one of them. So, you know, I'm asking for balance, and I'm saying, you know, find the money elsewhere without raising us, just for this little tiny amount, you know. And the other little question that I have all the time is, we pay a city tax, we pay a county tax. The county reimburses the city for duplicate services, just like the mayor just said. I never see that rebate, so I get to pay for this, I get to pay for that, but I never see a rebate. I, why, if there's a rebate coming from the county for a duplicate service paid for by the tax-paying homeowner, do we not get a little bit of cash back? So all of this feels out of balance and somewhat unfair. So, you know, that's just my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And I realize I neglected to uh, ask if there was some particular language that needs to be read as part of the constant yield public hearing. The only thing I just wanted to note tonight is the council is not being asked to set the tax rate this evening. You certainly have that option if you so choose. Um, but as scheduled, first reading of the ordinance establishing the tax rate will take place on May 14th with second reading on May 21st. So if the council is not setting the tax rate this evening, which I don't anticipate that you will, we are required by law to announce the dates when that will take place. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to testify at the constant <clears throat> yield public hearing? My only comment is that I think 
I think it is um, unevenly distributed. Uh, the increase would be unevenly distributed because I am fortunate Catholic enough Court. to have lived here for a very long time, and so there is a cap on how much my tax can go up every year. But newer residents who bought at the peak of the market um, are not as protected by that because, in fact, their properties were so high when they bought them. And so newer residents are going to be unevenly charged for this. And so I don't know if there's a way to uh, look at that and distribute it more evenly, as the prior speaker said. Um, I do think that in some cases renters will be affected by this also because people who own rental properties are not protected. Uh, and having a tax increase is actually one way they can raise the rent because the, my understanding of the way the rent control works is that that's, that is a qualifying cost uh, to raising the rent on, on their tenants. So anyway, I just, I just want to look at for fairness there that newer people, and also because we do try and provide uh, and look out for people who maybe can't afford some of our housing, make affordable housing a, a goal here. Uh, so maybe we should consider not letting this rise. Thank Thanks. you. And oh, can, can you identify Brickville. yourself for the record? Kat Kathy Brickville, Woodland Avenue. Sorry. Thanks. Anybody else for the Constant Yield Public Hearing? Hi, Roger Schlegel, Allegheny Avenue. Um, thanks for letting me testify. I just just got here. Um, I just wanted to kind of echo what the previous speaker was saying. In the neighborhood where I live, Pinecrest, we have a number of houses that have been for sale for several months. And when I see people um, stopping by to visit the houses and look at them, there's lots of foot traffic, lots of open houses. People love the houses and everybody on the street will buttonhole them and say this is a great street, great neighborhood. And people keep walking away and the reason they say is it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of property and we'd love to live here but the taxes, when you look at the tax rate in Tacoma Park is just shockingly higher than it would be if we bought in Silver Spring. So I am concerned that it's hard for me, just as someone who wants to have a, a neighborhood of um, occupied houses, it's hard for me to close the deal and, and sell the city to newcomers because of that tax rate. And while I don't know how you can make it fair for people um, who bought during the peak, I do think that if we took steps, if we could take steps to make our goals clear within the budget and to say how our money was achieving certain measurable goals, that would be a great way to say, okay, Tacoma Park does have a higher tax rate. We're willing to own that because we can show you specifically the things that we have set out to accomplish and are accomplishing. So this, this relates to an idea that a Ward 1 resident Douglas Grube has brought up before to the council the idea of experimenting with a program budget and um, essentially the idea there is to I'm sure you're familiar with the concept but just the idea is to set forth specific goals that would be measurable and then attach money to the accomplishment of those goals over a multi-year period and that's one of the recommendations of the Tacoma Junction Task Force so it would be a possible place to experiment with that. Essentially what it involves is taking a little bit of time to cross-reference elements in the budget so that, that those allocations can be tracked across time. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify at the Constant Yield Public Hearing? Okay, seeing none, I'll close that public hearing. And we will go next to the public hearing on the 
FY13 budget. And uh, one person has signed up, Eric Hensel. Hey, Eric Hensel, 308 Mississippi. Um, I'm here tonight because I think, as most of you have recognized, I'm often the sole survivor in the audience you know, watching the budget procedures as it goes on. And I've had some time to reflect, and there was a comment I would like to make. I was going to share some observations I had because I think the budget for any government is the way you find out the truth about that government. I mean, you can have all sorts of policies and procedures. But it's, it's how and when and what you do with your money is really what's important. So, but I'm not really speaking on one particular budget item uh, that I've seen. But instead, the budget is a working document. You know, my concern is with really the lack of performance measures I saw in that document. Um, and that was my first impression and listening to when people talk about the budget. So I went through and cut and paste all 165 management objectives out of the document and just put them in a running list, which actually kind of helps you sort of see what they're trying to tell about what's happening in the division. And I was really surprised there's a very a small fraction of anything that's quantifiable. Um, some measures were, you know, only, only measurable because they were binary. A project would be completed or not. Um, some are merely restatements of long, long uh, regularly accomplished tasks. I mean, the, the solid waste was like, our objective is to you know, pick up the recycling. Um, I, that doesn't really tell me much about an objective. I mean, that's more like what you do for decades on end. Um, there were vague, and there were you know, instances where things could have been quantified, like um, police administrative services plans to reduce the backlog of reports awaiting submittal for records management system, but there's really no idea of any sort of goal, target, any sort of understanding of what reduce means in this set. But you know, I'm not making observations about the lack of measurement um, in these objectives to indict city workers or management for somehow not un, uh, not performing their jobs or to sort of intimate there's some phantom spending or phantom inefficiencies going on. Um, I don't believe performance measures are a panacea to answer all the questions you could have to managing a city. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I do think we believe we need more quantification within these objectives to provide better guidance to city council and to the public about the efficacy of our city expenditures. Yeah. The meaning of objective is to reach a new place, a new condition that has not existed. And what we have is something that doesn't tell us that we're getting somewhere. You know, there is little in the way of feedback that we can be, um, no, I'm running out of time here. Um, when I see objectives, they have words like continue, maintain, improve, call out for some clarification through measurable you know, these These words call out for clarification through measurable goals. When you just talk in these loose terms, how are we going to know about council members and the public? They're going to know if something has been continued, has been maintained, has been promoted, has been promoted. We just don't know. So when you look at the lists of the things that we're trying to, attempting to do as a city, I really think the document itself does not give much guidance to the public as to what sort of our hopes and dreams for the future are going to be, so much as it looks like oftentimes placeholders or oftentimes an opportunity to be able to define our success after the fact. And I think that's something no one here wants. But I think when we have go back and, and look at this document, I can't see anything else but sort of a vagueness that does not help the, the efficiency of government spending and the efficiency of our programming. And we need to be able to go back and say, did we do this, yes or no? Instead of saying, well, we'll pick up the recycling, you know, we say, we'll increase the tonnage that has been recycled by X percent. That way you can go back and look. And that's a very simple metric. It's not a complicated metric. But it's something that we can say, like, look, we are going to build some measure of improvement into these objectives and not simply use them to say we're going to be doing the same things we've been doing for the past 10 or 15 years. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other names listed, but anybody else who'd like to testify? Yep. 
Joe Edgel, 1001 Elm Avenue. Uh, I'm here, as you probably know, uh, to uh, talk about the environmental portion of the budget and specifically the sustainability coordinator uh, portion of the budget. I want to compliment the council and the city manager for programming the funds and really appreciate that. One of the things that the task force on environmental action emphasized was spending some cash to actually get something for our recommendations. One problem that uh, I've noted that I hope maybe you can remedy is that a significant portion of the budget for FY13 is actually unspent carryover from FY12. So the money's not actually um, quite as much as seems to be implied through the document. So what I, and I know at least one other member of the Task Force on Environmental Action recommend is that you spend the money this year. We, we know there are a number of things that can be done this year, and there's no reason to wait. Spend that money this year and program additional funds for next year, consistent with the budget which the city manager has recommended. That would go a long way toward advancing this. If we don't do that, unfortunately, it's really just delaying this recommendation yet another year. I think we're close to two years downrange from the report now, um, and we still have yet to see um, a significant amount of funds uh, spent on these environmental issues. Uh, one other thing in my remaining time that I'd like to reemphasize <coughs> is uh, the concept of a staff person, not a contractor. I took a look at the SAIC contract, which was recommended. Um, and it, while they had a number of deliverables, I have no doubt that we could probably, through a significantly well-funded staff position, get more bang for the buck that we were expecting from SAIC. I think they were a defense contractor to SAIC, so you know, one of the concerns as well. Um, and I suspect that's something that a staff contract uh, staff could be screened for pretty easily. Um, last comment on this issue: um, whenever you're looking at a potential impacts on the budget and you're talking with the Public Works Department, the city manager, I'd request that you look at um, things that can be done for low amounts of money. Uh, for example, when traffic calming measures are employed, uh, it's easy to oftentimes uh, do curb cuts so that you can do stormwater retention areas just outside those traffic calming measures. And those can be done at just small incremental uh, increases in funds. So one of the things to consider. Um, didn't want to come up in the last time, but I want to let you know I was an um, active duty JAG officer for six years. Um, when I was working on the Hill, I commented on the National Defense Authorization Act and um, has some real concerns. And as a former JAG, I, I really support the city um, putting together a resolution opposing that uh, law. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, when these great minds start talking, I get very excited. Two things that I thought of as I listen to my comrades here talking. One, I don't see a line item that talks about business development or marketing Tacoma Park <coughs> as a great place, you know, something that would increase the kind of businesses that we could have. You know, we have five vintage stores in a quarter mile area and no place to buy something to wear to work. You know, we really, again, balance, balance, balance. I would like to see mixed use when I go to downtown Silver Spring, which, you know, we can't match that one. Or maybe we could. Or Alexandria. You see the usual corporates, you know. I love them. Yes, I do. But we see also individual, independent, small business. That mixed use, you know. So there's something for everybody. I, I would like to see us develop a business development plan like that, find a way to market Tacoma Park as a place where people have the income to buy certain things, because some of us do, where, you know, the folks who don't have a lot of money have a place they can buy things they need reasonably. You know, a mixed use look at that. And we, we really don't see a lot of that in, in this budget, you know, and a marketing plan. Let's get the folks who have money to invest in this town to come in here and, you know, Create a tax base. And um, perhaps a little bit of cash to help some of the animal rescuers. we got a lot of animal-friendly folks around here. and They do it all on their own dime. Yep, they do. And, you know, we claim to care about all living things around here, so let's help out the folks who walk their talk. Thank you. Thank you.
Kathy Breckville, Woodland again. Um, I want to uh, also speak in favor of the city manager's proposal to put uh, 1.2 million toward paying down off, paying down and off, uh, the previous pension bond. Um, because that is an accrued debt that we owe. And um, there's no point paying interest on that. We're going to have incremental increases on that debt as we go on. It's not going to ever stop. The other thing is that I am reluctant to see um, 750000 put into paying off the community center early. That's something we use every day. It's something that we can continue to pay as the schedule allows. Um, if, if those of us who should leave the city in the next year or two uh, shouldn't have to be bearing the burden of that since the center will be here indefinitely, we hope. Um, and the other thing is that, again, anything that we do have as discretionary funds in the budget to help the lower income people because, once again, we're losing diversity in the city. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Loveless. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Pat Loveless, 7620 Maple Avenue, the Franklin. And uh, your favorite peace delegate, I would like to uh, bring up the idea of uh, when you Planning the budget, remember, a dollar can only be spent once. You're spending the city's money. It's not just your money, but it's the entire city's money. And we're entrusting you to make the proper decisions. That's why you were elected. So uh, the idea of, uh, you know, of uh, buying something that makes it look really nice and is not all that functional, if you ever do that, that's not a very good decision with the economy the way it is. But uh, we, are, we do have to concentrate on the environment because as we see in the last couple of months, the temperature has been getting hot in the winter and hotter. it's going to be hotter in the summer as, as global warming takes over because I've never seen it reach the 80s in, the, in February and March until this year. So we have to budget in for our environment and really be conscious of it. So we, that's something we have to concentrate on in our budget, just taking care of our environment and taking care of the world so we can pass it down to our children in a better state than it was when we got it. That's my mission, trying to make the world a better place than it was when I got it. As a peace delegate, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'd like to, you people to keep that in mind when you, when you pass your budget. <laughs> because uh, it's very important what, when, you, when you spend a dollar for the city, because you're spending the city's dollars. You know, some people don't have that much. And we're entrusting you people to make a proper decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing none. Sorry. I just wanted to add Roger Schlegel, Allegheny Avenue, that I was really happy to hear what Eric Hensel had to say. And it obviously ties in with the idea of program or performance budgeting and since this is a secondary hearing I'll I'll say it again just to give an example uh, we, we need to put the make sure we have progress in addition to being a progressive town we can't be progressive unless we can say we've re really made progress and setting objectives measuring reevaluating strategies and moving forward that's progress just to give an example, because the situations are urgent, take the Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. We have got to reduce our stormwater flows. <laughs> that involves spending a limited amount of dollars to and choosing the best possible projects with the biggest impact. And so we're going to move forward with Flower Avenue. I'm still wondering, I think Flower Avenue certainly deserves a rebuild, but I'm still wondering whether the top of a hill is the most cost-effective place to do uh, major stormwater green street measures. Like, I keep wondering, if we had that money to spend once, would it have been better spent on Maple Avenue or something where we're closer to the creek, we've got big parking lots and rooftops draining down that way. 
it's it's the kind of thinking that we're not going to do unless we have the measurable goal out there in front of us and we say hmm how do we get the most bang for our buck and we, we need to put those goals out there and then set up programs to see if we can achieve them thank you thank you anybody else okay I will call a close to the public hearing on the FY 2013 budget that was our second public hearing on the budget and of course until we finished with the budget we welcome your comments on the budget we will now move to the budget work session and the Recreation Department budget which is delayed from last week when we didn't have time First, let me start by uh, saying that I am pleased uh, to present as the Recreation Director uh, the 20, 2013 uh, budget for the department. Um, the, we don't get it, I don't get an opportunity to publicly, um, you know, say things about uh, the wonderful staff that we have. Um, so, you know, this past fiscal year, uh, with being down three uh, career staff, our staff was able to maintain uh, service levels, current service levels in the department. Um, you know, there were over 1,900 new uh, active net uh, uh, new accounts uh, that were started, which uh, translates directly into new customers. Um, and in addition, and lastly, we were able to serve over 800 uh, young people uh, throughout our camps, which I'll be able to uh, point back to these uh, items later on throughout the budget process, throughout the, my presentation. Um, I'll start off with the uh, FY13 uh, financials um, in the administra administrative division. Um, our division expenditures are approximately uh, $1,476 lower than previous fiscal year. Um, in this uh, division, the transaction costs associated with online registrations are contained here, and they constitute approximately $22,000. That's online registrations for uh, the ActiveNet uh, system. Um, and I would like to highlight that management objectives uh, for the administrative division uh, directly mirror the goals that are outlined in the new vision for recreation services uh, that was uh, passed by the council in October. For the, the Tacoma Park Recreation Center, uh, division FTEs uh, increased by 0 0.05. Uh, the expenditures in the recreation center are approximately $5,837 higher than the previous uh, fiscal year. The uh, increase is directly attributable to an increase in contractors. Um, uh, John has done a wonderful job at that facility um, in bringing in revenue, and uh, we thought that, you know, we believe that he can uh, gain more revenue and offer more classes and programs and services at that facility. Uh, so he has uh, a little bit more. Uh, money to actually program with. In the Community Programs Division, expenditures are $2,600 higher. Uh, the increase is directly attributable to a new futsal league uh, that we have for young people. Um, the division's FTEs increased by 0 .05, uh, which is attributable to an additional hours for a Recreation Supervisor 1, which is uh, a position that uh, we've added hours to make full time. The, the current position is a 35 hour position. We transition that to a 40 hour uh, position. Next is uh, athletic fields and facilities. Um, mainly in this division uh, are our ICB rentals, uh, 
fees, which are approximately uh, $18,188. Um, and there's also money in this division to maintain the athletic fields, uh, which the contract is approximately $18,464. Our next division is our camps division, which the division expenditures are approximately $4,300 higher, uh, which is attributable to personnel costs. And the division FTEs in this uh, division uh, decreased by 0.72. Next is uh, our before and after school programs. Um, expenditures are approximately $8,300 lower which is attributable to us utilizing career staff in lieu of contractors for um, the after school uh, uh, clubs and, and for contractors. So we're going to utilize the skills of staff in that area uh, versus paying a contractor. The next division is the Coma Park Community Center. Um, expenditures in this division are approximately $5,400 higher which is attributable to the transfer of the admin one position from the general government department. Um, in this division, there's also an increase of uh, in programmatic supports for teens and seniors, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, FTEs also in the Tacoma Park uh, Community Center increased by 0.26. There are several programmatic highlights that I would like to point out. Um, that directly relate to uh, uh, those financials. As you know, in October, um, Council approved a new vision for recreation services. Um, the document contained input from the Recreation Committee, Recreation Department staff, and city residents. With the submission of this budget, I attempted to begin the process of implementing the goals and objectives uh, highlighted in the new vision. And please understand that this budget contains only phase one um, of, the, of an incremental process that will be used to implement the objectives uh, in the new vision. Objecti objectives that the department addressed uh, with this budget that were contained in the new vision were uh, working in collaboration with a wide range of partners, including volunteers, uh, implementing use of the integrated service delivery model where applicable, actively promoting programs across the socioeconomic and diverse backgrounds, and establishing a systematic process to determine fee structure uh, and price differential. The new vision also supports the allocation of additional financial resources uh, for the funding of teen and, and senior programs. Funding for teen and se teen programs in this budget increased by $9,000. The additional resources will be used to develop a, a uh, team program that includes developmental opportunities for young people, job readiness uh, programs and workshops, and partnerships. In addition, there will be money uh, dedicated uh, to the support of programming for uh, the underserved one of the, they're older than teens, but the underserved young adult, which is ages 18 to 24. So uh, a set of monies will be uh, set aside just for that group. Seniors program funding in this budget increased by 32%, which is a total of $4,000. Um, the funds will be used to offer additional programs and special events to the senior population, uh, which is exploding right now. Um, an emphasis will be placed on, uh, with the new funds, an emphasis will be placed on reaching uh, el elderly reti early retirees and active seniors, the more active seniors uh, with that. Providing art and cultural activities has also been identified in the new, in the new vision uh, as a goal. This budget provides resources for increased art opportunities for young people. Those increased art opportunities include new da cultural dance club and our afternoon edition program, uh, new winter break camp uh, that will be focusing on the arts that will take place uh, in December, a four to six week uh, program in the summer. It will be a performing arts program. Um, and that program we're looking to culminate 
in a performance here in the auditorium. Um, so monies will, are put aside in, the, in, the, in that budget to uh, bring in a contractor to run to actually run that program. And an after-school visual arts program for middle school uh, young people uh, that will be taught by Recreation Department staff uh, in partnership with uh, Art for the People. Attracting diverse population of city residents is also a priority shared in a new, in a new vision. The department is committed to providing programs and opportunities to residents uh, that meet this need. This budget includes funding for new special events that would attract diverse residents and unite them around a common theme. Uh, several themes and new special events uh, or special events that we'll, we look to support are a healthy eating, uh, healthy cooking uh, expo. Um, uh, a fitness expo uh, that will take place at the uh, Recreation Center. And of course, support uh, for the World Festival. Funding has also been set aside to increase the, uh, as I stated earlier, to increase the hours of the Recreation Supervisor 1, which those increased hours will be uh, used to uh, uh, lead the department's special events programs and activities. The Recreation Department is committed to working with the council, the city manager, the Recreation Committee, and the city residents uh, to provide um, innovative and affordable uh, leisure services uh, to the residents of the city of Tacoma Park. And with this budget, I think we've outlined um, the beginning of the new vision uh, for recreation services that the council spoke about in late October. Thank you. Anything else that anybody wants to add before I go to questions from the council? Okay, uh, Council Member Siemens. Well, I uh, <coughs> thank you for the presentation and the budget and the many hours of work that went into the budget. I am especially uh, especially thrilled to to see um, the budget following down the line with the uh, goals that the. Uh, council had set uh, right before you took over the department, and I, uh, I think it uh, speaks well for the whole approach to the council giving clear goals uh, and objectives, and um, uh, hopefully it makes your job a little easier when you know what it is that the council expects. Uh, you know, I. Um, if we had the luxury of time, I'd like to sit here and tell you all the things I think uh, that I see that go well with the department. I'm sure there are many other things that I would miss, but uh, um, I'm not going to dwell on them. I will say, you know, obviously the senior programs are a uh, real highlight, um, but uh, many other things are going well in the department, and I compliment you on that. Um, the one area that I see that um, I think we still have a, a lot of room for improvement on is um, is working with the young people and um, by the time they reach high school age uh, they should have a uh, I think an interest and a respect uh, for the staff that I don't see and many of the young people, uh, the, the high school age youth uh, here at the center. And uh, I'd be interested to hear uh, how that's going to change. I know you've only been in this position now for a short amount of time, uh, but I think that's, that's, some, that's something where we need uh, to be doing better. We need the young people to be involved early on so they uh, establish a relationship with us and uh, continue in uh, positive work uh, through the Recreation Center and, um, and not just come here to hang out but come here to, to really uh, participate and to do things. So I'd be interested to hear uh, and what your approach is to get us to that position. Well, the first, <coughs> the first step of that approach will be to hire a, uh, a team uh, a manager. <laughs> um, that position has actually been vacant since uh, January. Um, that, that, by the way, is it our fault? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, You've had the fun. The my approach would be to you know we we as a department um, have been offering some great. Uh, recreation programs and services for young people and we have had a challenge uh, of getting young people uh, in the building as part of our programs um, some programs uh, do well um, of course we, with varying results uh, for um, you know based on the time of year the time of day that you're having and what's going on in uh, the school system but the teen population is a a, a really difficult age group to program for. Um, my approach is going to be once the new person arrives, um, we're just not going to offer programs, which is which a program to me is, um, you know, a, a trip to the movies, uh, uh, to bring, bring in any type of speaker. We're, we're, my plan is to develop a, a system uh, to develop young people. Um, and once we have the system uh, developed, meaning we're going to offer developmental opportunities, we're going to offer trips, uh, we're going to offer, um, you know, bring in uh, speakers, we're going to have themed activities, um, we're, we're planning on uh, um, offering a um, rites of passage program uh, for young people. We're going to we're going to target uh, not only the teens, but we're going to target the teen parents. Um, we're going to get the kids involved in, in planning and programming uh, their own activities as adults. Um, you know, we can think that or, you know, we know exactly what the teens want, but unless we get them in here and have them tell us what they want to do and what they uh, would like to do and have them be a part of the planning process, which is the part of that growth that you were speaking about, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to uh, follow the same cycle. So we want to get them in here as and be a part of the planning process. Um, okay. I, that's good to hear. I think uh, one of the challenges is that uh, this is something that takes time to develop, uh, as I said, developing the relationships and the interests. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, that as you're uh, working with the younger uh, people, uh, you know, realizing that they're going to be the high schoolers uh, downstream not too too many years, uh, I would approach it uh, kind of as I approach raising kids, and that is you uh, try to nurture interests and uh, really, uh, you know, give them some free reins and also use those interests as uh, leverage. Uh, exactly. to, to do the things that maybe they don't want to do, but uh, they have to, to exactly. do uh, if they want to continue with the things they're interested in. So, you know, when you offer the variety of uh, programs to the younger ages and the young people get interested in, maybe it's uh, visual arts, uh, as they get older, you continue to offer more advanced opportunities uh, with those programs. So those kids that are interested in that, can develop further and uh, and also want to be here and want to be here for productive reasons. Anyways, that's just uh, free advice. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, and I know that uh, you've probably heard me talk about it before, but one of my concerns is that um, with the uh, emphasis that our police department has placed on gangs, uh, that um, I haven't uh, been aware of uh, a role that the Recreation Department is playing in um, reaching out to those uh, those kids that are in that, uh, that are vulnerable to the gangs and giving them a, a positive alternative and the type of support that they need so that they're uh, not influenced to go with the gang, but they're influenced to go in a more positive direction. I know that um, uh, the police have said and admitted that they cannot enforce their way out of the problem, uh, that we need to have the positive uh, approach in addition to the law enforcement. And so I'd be interested to hear how uh, your department 
is uh, either is or is planning to um, fill that gap and um, and maybe and I'd like to know if it's uh, if you have a relationship with the Youth Opportunity Center in Langley Park actually Terry Terry this is a you know it will be a uh, a, a sort of a layered approach um, you know recreation um, the department uh, we can play a part um, in uh, gang uh, intervention um, actually prevention I'm sorry um, but we have in the past we partnered with uh, the Workforce Development Corporation of Montgomery County um, and the street outwork street street outreach network um, and providing uh, gang prevention uh, as well as intervention uh, opportunities for young people here in Tacoma Park um, this past summer uh, which we'll continue to do um, uh, and working with those groups as well as uh, the group that's in Langley Park we actually had a meeting uh, a few months back with uh, that included the Tacoma Park Police Department um, along with se several other uh, gang um, prevention and intervention uh, organizations uh, here within Montgomery County um, but we'll, we'll continue those uh, efforts and partnering um, especially dealing with the intervention right now our staff isn't trained um, to deal with uh, intervention um, but you know we focus more on the preventative side but if we once we do uh, have young people that uh, we know of are in gangs we are working closely with those groups to make sure that they get to those services uh, that they actually need um, uh, I mentioned the Workforce Development Corporation uh, earlier um, I uh, uh, offered the Workforce Development Corporation uh, free space uh, this past summer to come in and train uh, any young people any young person um, that wanted to be trained uh, for positions and they actually offered the young people jobs and took them on uh, uh, job interviews and found jobs for them, uh, taught them how to write, create resumes and things of that nature and uh, a couple of young people that were involved in gangs actually got jobs uh, from those uh, events. We've also worked closely with the Tacoma Park Police Department, um, Chief Rikuchi and his staff um, in uh, I want to say uh, intervening on with uh, several young people here in Tacoma Park um, as a group the roundtable effort on tr trying to uh, figure out what types of services that uh, this p these particular individuals need in order to succeed um, uh, they were still minors so I really can't you know say who they were but we are uh, vested um, in uh, preventing uh, young people from uh, getting in gangs and if young people are involved in gangs then we'll continue to partner with uh, outside organizations to come in and provide uh, intervention services for them thank you and Barb I would ask that maybe on the reconciliation budget we look at uh, what uh, expense we might want to add to uh, enhance our intervention capabilities and whether or not that might not qualify under the speed camera uh, funds as public safety and then lastly I would just like to uh, compliment Lou on his uh, selection for an Azalea Award congratulations and I'd like to take this opportunity to remember that Councilmember Mayo joined us at the beginning of the meeting and I've kind of forgotten to see if he had any comments so I want to go to Councilmember Mayo if he's still hanging in there and see if you have anything you want to say about recreation thank you mayor and um, I do thank you I, I just wonder if you can hear me okay are you uh, are you guys hearing this okay we're fine great um, well thank you for the uh, the presentation Greg um, I have a couple of questions um, some are just follow up from earlier meetings and some are specifically related to the budget um, relating to an earlier meeting we at one point talked about uh, the city um, competing for uh, a, a daycare or an after-school program that would be hosted in the Piney Branch is that project still ongoing or is that just an idea that hasn't come to fruition in this budget no that was an idea that has not come to fruition uh, there are several things that need to take place prior to 
uh, that uh, one being the Recreation Department receiving uh, its uh, daycare license, um, and the other is to uh, you know that that's a bid bidded process um, that should okay. be currently going on. So we haven't done the, taken the necessary steps to move forward. Great, thanks. That's, that's fine. I just uh, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, the uh, City manager sent out a, a supplemental document that break down, breaks down revenue. It's an Excel table. Is that something that, that you all have in front of you, or is it just me that has it? We have it in front of us. Okay, great. I was going to ask, if you look at the, um, the projected revenue from the different programs, camp, community center, uh, before and after, et cetera, um, you know, over the, since 2007, there's a, there's a fairly significant increase. It's, you know, it's roughly a 30% a increase in program revenue. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective, if you see, you know, whether that, um, what the consequence of that is, what the consequence of the fees going in, has it had any effect on uh, participation programs? Are we, um, you know, are there any problems associated with it? And, and I guess a, a related question, and I'll just keep talking since I'm remote here and it's a little bit harder, is I'm really interested in um, in this the, the ability of uh, your department to be able to start tracking. Um, you know, revenue broken down by the senior programs and the, the kids' programs versus the adults' programs, because I think it would be consistent with uh, previous council direction to, you know, really focus on the, the beginning and end there. Um, and so I just, my question about the, the, the revenue trend is, is sort of in that context. Okay. Um, can you repeat the revenue trend um, quest, um, question? Yes. I heard sure. you. Yes. Yeah, I'm just noting that in 2007 or the FY 2007 budget, we were bringing in 270,000, 270,000 from the various fees, and this year is proposed to be 370,000 roughly. And so, I, I just wonder your thoughts on uh, that trend, um, and whether uh, you expect it to continue, or whether you think it comes at a cost, and we want to try to try to not um, not make programs too expensive. I mean, it's just just generally about the cost. Okay. Well, um, from my perspective, I think that, you know, and we've, as a department, have come a long way uh, since uh, 2007, um, FY07, uh, one being the, uh, the addition of this building, am I correct, uh, City Manager Matthews? Yes, the building, I, if I recall, it seems like it's such a long time ago, I think was completed in 2000, fiscal 2006 is when all phases of the building were complete, if okay. I recall. So the, 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 a full year of uh, programming actually began in FY07. Um, so the, the, the trend uh, being that the department realized the, the potential for uh, program, programmatic uh, options for this building um, and the department continue to increase uh, the, the programs um, for uh, various ages um, uh, in the building. Um, I do know that in uh, FY11, um, well, it, throughout the, uh, the, since FY07, uh, the department has increased fees uh, for several programs. Um, you know, mainly it's uh, the larger programs, which were the the camps and the after school programs, as you'll take a look, which are the uh, the, the main uh, revenue generators uh, for the department. Um, and I do do believe that the uh, if I can recall correctly, that fees for those programs were increased uh, twice uh, since I've been here. Um, um, I do believe that. We will hit a, a, a ceiling at some point. Um, I do see room for that we can still continue to uh, increase revenue. Um, I've been working with uh, my staff on identifying some, some alternative uh, ways to increase revenue. I'll uh, give you a, a, a few that we've uh, come up with. Uh, you know, the, the new contractors that we uh, currently, our contractors are on a 70-30 split um, uh, with the city receiving 30% of the revenue. Um, new contractors that will uh, come aboard, uh, you know, we'll, we're proposing to change that contract to percentage to 60-40, uh, which would uh, gain more uh, revenue uh, for the city. So we, we're thinking of ways um, 
you know, such as this, um, the addition of the winter uh, camp, um, you know, is a, and it, which camps are, you know, some of our, you know, largest revenue generators. Uh, so we're thinking of little ways like this to, to increase revenue, which um, if we continue to uh, be innovative, uh, continue to market and maximize the opportunities that we have in our current programs, um, you know, I think that we can continue to uh, see uh, small growth, uh, you know, for a few years. But at some point, uh, we're going to maximize use of this facility, um, which, of course, limits our uh, ability to uh, continuously uh, grow revenue. Okay, great. I appreciate that. And just um, one more question, and this is uh, partly a comment and also uh, directed at, um, at City Manager Matthews. I, I really appreciated the comments from the public tonight about uh, metrics and budget and, uh, and giving us a sense of where we're going. And so it's my hope that um, these aren't things we necessarily need to change in, the, in this budget document, but I'd really like to have a process, and I'm hoping uh, that we can do so, not to change the budget or the dollar allocations, but to wherever possible look at where we're trying to make a, a change in service, a change in outcomes. Um, and you've heard me talk before about the, the recycling pickup. Um, we've talked about uh, re uh, replacing ADA sidewalks. Um, I know that we've had other earlier conversations about metrics in the, in the rec department. And I just I hope that we still have time later on to talk more about uh, the metrics of success with various departments. Um, I appreciate um, some of what's in the in the rec program, but even there, I'd like to see more, um, uh, a little bit more transparency around uh, the kids we're serving and uh, the outcomes we're getting from programs. Actually, uh, Council Member Mail, um, we do have the ability in the Recreation Department uh, via our electronic registration system to break down the revenue uh, by age group. Okay, that's great. Great. I'll, I'll uh, look forward to following up with you about that later on. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councilmember Mail. Um, I just have a quick follow-up on one point that he raised. If you can just take a second, and if you could characterize the uh, the increase in revenues from programs as to whether the preponderance of it is the raising of fees or the increase in the number of programs available and the slots available within those programs. If you can just characterize that. Well, they're, they're, we've done both uh, uh, throughout the years. Um, uh, a, a good example would be our afternoon edition program. In uh, FY10, uh, we were capped out at um, 50 young people uh, that participated in that program. Um, in FY11, uh, along with raising the fees in that program, we added 10 slots. We were, you know, we started went from serving 50 kids to to 60 kids. Um, in our summer camp programs, um, we really in FY, I want to say the end of FY10, I believe, according to the, uh, the revenue, we, we sat down as a staff and we held a workshop and we really uh, brainstormed and came up with ways that we can maximize use of this building in our summer camps uh, programs. And that was the, all, the addition of uh, specialty camps. Um, with the addition of those specialty camps, um, the specialty camps came at a higher higher cost than the general recreation camp, um, and which allowed us to, of course, serve more young people. Um, and then we were able to uh, really figure out and maximize the use of our transportation, which uh, we, were, we were able to figure out, you know, what our max number is per week per kid, which uh, we hadn't been reaching before. And we increased our marketing, which allowed us, of course, to take more kids on and offer uh, quality uh, summer camps that uh, residents of Tacoma Park wanted to participate in. Um, the, it was a trend at that time to move towards uh, specialty camps uh, during the summer. Um, so we as a department took that on and uh, found ways to increase our uh, numbers as well as increase the revenue. Um, we increased the price incrementally. It wasn't much. Um, we had never offered a specialty camp, so um, our specialty camps were yes, um, offered at approximately uh, between $25 and $50 more than um, our general recreation camp. So it sounds like most of the increase is from increased programs and space in those programs. Yes, it's a, a combination. A okay. Yes. Um, and I'm just going to follow up with one or two other things. I had my own list and I was going to wait, but they pertain to exactly what you've been talking about. So I'll just 
um, follow up. Um, <clears throat> you talked about the potential change in the split with the contractors. Um, the other side of that is, does it work for the contractors? Is that a, is that a, you know it's it's not just a revenue enhancement for the city in doing those, but can you just kind of characterize your the, the status of your relationship with your contractors and how that's all going and kind of is it working for them? Is it working for us? Right. The, the, well, let me say that the uh, the contractors that we currently have uh, will be grandfathered fathered into the contract that they're under now. So we aren't looking to uh, increase the percentage of uh, revenue that we receive from those contractors. Um, so, you know, they're grandfathered in as long as they teach here, they'll be um, under those guidelines. And the, and the, and the current guidelines Seven, work, work for them and yes, work for us? Yes, yes, the okay. current guidelines work for both parties. Um, we're speaking of the new contractors uh, that come in, um, in particular, um, in, you know, contractors that are in our after-school programs and camps. Um, if we bring a, a camp contractor in, um, you know, they can make some significant money at 70-30 uh, split. Um, if a camp is advertised at $200 and you get, uh, you know, 20 kids in it, you know, you can, you know, just do the math. Um, which is, you know, for for a week camp, you know, it's a pretty good, pretty substantial amount of money. Um, and the recreation department for mo most of those camps provide the staff. Um, so we we were thinking of um, <coughs> to off offer less of a percentage uh, to those uh, campers or to those contractors. Um, and provide them, of course, with the same services that we've already been providing them um, with um, only, of course, for the folks that are coming in brand new, uh, which is still a, a four weeks camp or a program that only lasts an hour a day, a uh, pretty substantial uh, amount of money. Um, uh, another example is for an after-school program. Um, you know, a contractor, you know, may come in and charge us 20 bucks an hour. Um, for a particular program, you know, so of course 70 or 60 percent of, you know, the $20 an hour um, that okay. we'll get, so. Okay. And and the other question I had uh, has to do with the transportation aspect of some of the programs. I was wondering how the, uh, the, the bus that we have is is working whether we have adequate drivers, whether there's expansion opportunities for the types of things that we do using the bus, just a little characterization of the bus usage and the abilities that we have there. I think in, uh, over the past few years our bus usage um, has uh, increased. Um, you know, ironically this is uh, one of the objectives that I was going to task, uh, you know, one of the, once we, of course, become full staff, one of the staff, which, which is really to track the hours um, of the bus um, and the destination. We have a system uh, right now, but the tabulation of it is, is you know, is really not assigned, but, you know, it's something that um, I look to do uh, in the coming fiscal year. But the, the bus right now, both buses, both uh, buses are being utilized um, um, and I want to say quite often, um, we have uh, began, um, of course, uh, partnerships, with, of course, transporting uh, seniors to uh, various events um, outside, um, well, events that take place here in the auditorium um, through a partnership with the, uh, the various uh, senior housing uh, um, uh, complexes. Uh, of course, we transport seniors to um, the farmer's market. Uh, we utilize the bus to transport uh, young people from the recreation center down here to the community center to uh, participate in various activities. Um, you know, using the, We utilize uh, more city vehicles uh, in lieu of uh, Montgomery County transportation uh, for our summer programs um, and transporting young people to and from the pool. Um, so uh, I, I would say that our bus uh, usage has increased um, over the past couple of years, uh, and we are looking for more ways uh, um, to increase the use of the uh, of that vehicle, of both vehicles, actually. Because I know there were concerns about whether they were being utilized 
and I didn't know whether we had an adequate pool of, uh, of drivers. Yes, um, over the past, drivers. I want to say over the past two or three months, um, we have uh, increased the number of, of uh, CDL drivers um, to drive the, uh, well, actually one bus is, is the only bus that right. needs a CDL driver. And I believe that we have approximately five, we have five, Okay, three new um, drivers, uh, which, which totals five uh, drivers that are CDL eligible and have gone through background check and those okay, things. Okay, so. good. That's good to hear. Thanks. Councilmember Snipper. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I want to um, thank the Recreation uh, Department staff. I think they do a terrific job. Um, having done a little work in recreation when I was young, I can, I can say that... Uh, REC in particular is it's all people, it's all relationships, it's all working with um, mostly hard to work with <laughs> folks. You know, you've got um, on the one hand you have seniors who may have various mobility problems or cognitive issues or, you know, other kinds of things, financial issues too. Uh, and then you have youth on the other hand. So a lot of what REC is is tact distraction, uh, a lot of role modeling, you know, you've got to be perfect all the time. You have to somehow not being re be reactive uh, when the youth start testing their limits, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not telling you anything new. So I, I just want to say I appreciate the, that it's a hard job and I think you do it well. Um, the second thing I want to say is I really appreciate the attention to the new uh, vision that we worked out. Um, uh, this is a process, as you were indicating, you know, we're in phase one, you know. Uh, you try some things, you see if they work, you try something else, you see if it, it works, you roll it out, you know. You don't, incremental change is kind of the name of the game. Um, and I really appreciate that. I'm glad to see some movement on the uh, graduated experience, uh, graduated responsibility for youth kind of designs in, the, in some of the programs. Um, I just think that's a terrific direction to to try out. I'm uh, very happy about the special events. As you know, it's a particular favorite of mine. So I'm happy to see that. I'm also glad to see the increased uh, bus use. Um, <clears throat> Ward 5 is, uh, you know, a little farther away. And, uh, you know, getting down to the community center is hard for a lot of Ward 5 uh, residents. So I'm glad to see that. And then, um, <clears throat> just a slight aside, uh, I can't resist. Um, the, those who've been on the council for a long period of time know, know my <clears throat> harping, perhaps is the right word, on performance-based budgeting. Uh, for the first few years I was on the council, um, I guess I got worn down uh, in the last year, year or so, and I haven't been pushing it as hard. So I really appreciate the uh, public uh, comments uh, supportive of that. Um, it is in the strategic plan. As I recall, it was to do one function, activity, or program uh, in each department as a way to start experimenting with, uh, with doing this. Um, I, I do want to say that I appreciate that this year wasn't the year, given um, tremendous uh, personnel and other problems in, uh, in the city staff. So I, um, you know, didn't, didn't say anything about it for this year, but I hope in the future that um, <clears throat> each department will um, identify an area that they can start uh, doing this kind of performance-based thing. So you can track, you know, the budget on one side and measurable outcomes on the other, along with some kind of uh, satisfaction or evaluation of that particular activity. It would really help the council decide you know, should we spend more money on this or less money on this, more staff or less staff, if we, if we had those kinds of measures. And I, I'm a fan of, you know, not converting the entire city budget. Just start out with a little bit and see how it goes. I'll stop there. Thanks. Councilmember Grimes. Thank you. So I'll stick to a few things that uh, other council members have not covered and that you have not covered, uh, and you did cover quite a lot. So I have uh, two questions. One is whether there is demand uh, for additional scholarships within the existing city programming that uh, is not going to be met with their current resources that are available for scholarships. Well, 
currently the way that the uh, the department of is, is, is structured is scholarships are just uh, when we do provide scholarships for programs they're just lost revenue um, we don't have a, a line item or a, uh, a money set aside that we um, uh, deduct from uh, an expenditure that we deduct from um, for that just particularly for scholarships. So if we offer a scholarship for a program, it's just lost revenue. So um, if there's space in a program, then you yes. are able to offer a scholarship uh, if it's needed. Yes, yes. And we have increased our marketing of um, our scholarship program. Um, and uh, the pr previous council um, also uh, wanted us to streamline the process for uh, residents are uh, receiving scholarships, uh, which we've uh, developed. Um, we've developed uh, guidelines uh, to streamline that process. Uh, right now, um, the uh, only documentation that to qualify for a scholarship um, for most recreation department programs um, is a show that uh, the, the person is. Um, on free or reduced lunch program uh, through the schools. Um, and of course with our afternoon edition program, which is our one of the, uh, our, actually our two um, revenue generator programs uh, that we have in the department, we still require documentation uh, just for those two programs. But the, all of the other programs uh, just require that sh you show that you're on free or reduced lunch and there's a fixed rate. There's no more uh, tiered system, so you know there's a fixed rate uh, for those scholarships. What about uh, contractor programs, contractor offered programs where there's a revenue split? Is that ex what's yeah. the system there? Yeah, the, the contractor, of course, will receive the 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 full revenue for the uh, the scholarship person. So there is some city um, outlay in those cases. Yes, yes that's, but that's it's not, that hasn't hit any kind of limit. No. It's, it's just lost revenue. Okay. Second question. There's some been some exploration of the possibility of opening up the library on Sunday afternoons, say from one from noon to five p.m. And their concern is that that would entail opening up the rest of this building or uh, the public portions of the rest of the building because of the fire uh, need for fire egress from the library. And if the building were to be open on Sundays from noon to five, would there be uh, sufficient demand for additional rec programming uh, that you could fill on Sunday afternoon specifically? I'll say traditionally, um, you know, I've, I've been in recreation for um, over 17 years. Traditionally, Sunday uh, is a slow day. Uh, for recreation programs and services. Um, so it's questionable. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. You, you would really have to, uh, you know, have a, a great program um, for, you know, to get really get residents out to uh, to participate in recreation programs on, on, on Sundays. And the tradition has just been, you know, rest day, uh, you know, for most uh, for most families. So have you worked at other places where there has been Sunday programming and it's been slow, or is that yes? Sort of but a, you know, the majority of those locations have had uh, a gym, and, and the things that we did offer uh, were like fifty and over basketball, a fifty and over basketball league uh, for you know, or, or something like that, or an adult basketball league. It was always something like that. It was never um, an art class, or you know, the traditional the the more traditional recreation programs. I am um, thinking more yeah. of youth programming, by the way, than uh, youth sports programming in particular, than of like adult programming. But right. Mm. Okay, that's fine. Okay. All right, that, that's it. And and I, I can actually do research. Um, just just as a tag along on that. Mm -hmm. Difficulties with finding staff to work on Sundays. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, when, at, when my old job. Uh, you know the the same people. You know it's, it's hard to find them first of all, but you know it was one consistent person that would all or two consistent people that would always work on Sundays. 
you know, and any time one of those folks are out, you know, a full-time staff uh, more than likely had to go in because most staff didn't want to work on Sundays. Okay. I, actually, let me let me just interject something. Uh, this is directed not to you specifically. Uh, Councilmember Daniels Cohen and I had just discussed an idea regarding the possibility of opening the library and the rest of the facilities on Sundays, which is to do it on a provisional basis, maybe one day a month, the first or the last Sunday of the month, see how it goes over the course of the year. And that uh, could be interesting if there's going to be, for instance, use of the space for community meetings where Sunday afternoons could be an attractive time, then there might be sufficient use for one day a month, uh, but not for four or five. So that's one thing that at least she and I had discussed that uh, the council can come back to later potentially. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Daniels Cohen. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm Nancy here. Um, you got to be quicker on that button. I, I know. There was, there was a flash of buttons over there. I wasn't fast yeah. enough. Um, we have come a long way, baby. Uh, since since the, uh, the the first since the first meeting, I think in 2007. I mean, this is terrifically exciting. This budget and and the, and the programming, and what else is terrifically exciting is seeing seeing the whole staff here, including the ma major parts of the recreation committee. Uh, that's that's really really quite quite thrilling uh, to me. And before I go farther, because I'll, I'll forget. Congratulations to Lou McAllister for his Azalea Award, but we also have another Azalea Award member, a winner in the audience here tonight, and that would be Roger Schlegel. He also, yes, he also won it. So that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. That's, uh, that's two out of ten of the Azalea Award winners are in, our, are in the room. So uh, I, um, let's see, this, it's hard. I've, I've written all over the paper, so it's hard to figure out where to go first. Uh, you know how thrilled I am about New Hampshire Avenue, the, the recreation, I call it the recreation center because I was the, I was probably, John came and I went out there and said, people said we don't have a recreation center and I said, oh yeah we do, it's on New Hampshire Avenue, it's a mile and a half away, it's not that far, we have a new, we have a recreation center. I'm so glad to see the programming coming along there. I'm loving the partnerships because I think in years gone by possibly we spoke partnerships you've really created partnerships and that's 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 pretty thrilling uh, of course the teen program uh, increasing the budget would i like to see more dollars there of course i would but nine thousand i mean you know it, it's it it's okay it's a step it's a step in the right direction senior adults i represent that and i'm i'm excited about seeing seeing uh, more more programming for the senior adults i think that the recreation department does a maximum I mean, as far as the biggest bang for your buck in the senior programming that's what you're getting that i cannot even fathom how much is done with so little facility and 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 not i don't even paul is not is she full time yes, she is yes, full time yes. okay but still she does a huge huge job um, where's the Yes League? Uh, where was I going to go with that? It's, ah, I can remember when all the meetings I went to, what did I say? Marketing, marketing, marketing. And you've really in, increased the marketing. And that, that's, that's what I think, I think part of the increase in the dollars is you've got more people coming to the programs. You've got more programs, but, you know, there's, we all know there's a break point in every, in every program like this where it's, it, it will increase, it will increase your income, income. I, that's what I said to Lou McAllister on Saturday night. I saw the, the sign. I saw it down at the corner, Sherman and Maple. And I went, yes, league, yes, league. And I see it, I see it up here. And I know the mayor's not crazy about those banners, but they bring people in to the programs. I remember last year you had a couple of people signed up. I think you put the sign up. Maybe it was a year before. I think you changed the, the fee structure a little bit, and it was massive youngsters. You know, and these are teenagers. These are these are uh, kids that might not be in that in that yes league if, if it weren't for for all of your all of your collective uh, hard work. Uh, where's number five? The mayor loves banners as long as they're not hanging on the railing. The I know building. he doesn't like <laughs> hanging on the railing, but both of these banners are hanging on the railing. But you know, sometimes it's it's easier to ask 
forgiveness than permission. So uh, I love that you've included uh, the planning for the 18 to 20 to, I think you said 24 year olds, yes. because I know we'd all discussed a couple of years ago the ready by 21. And I think that that uh, uh, council member uh, um, Siemens was talking about, you know, working with the kids. We've got we've got young people that are in that age group and, and they need some direction. I think I think with with your with the um uh, the, the after school programs and some of the, the youth leagues, of course, I, you know, you don't want to get me started on the Winter Basketball League because I think that's also fabulous. I think this was a bigger turnout this year than isn't, wasn't it the biggest so far? This yes. is the fourth year. It was the, the largest. And you may be reaching, you know, uh, a, a, a boiling point there. You may not be able to go past what it was this year. I, you know, so um, where else? I've got stuff all over the place. Ah, the new field. I'm going to call it Ed Wilhelm Field. I mean, that's what the field's called. But the skate park and what all's going on over there. Is that a Montgomery County facility? It, it, are they going to program that? Are you going to? Are we going? I don't mean you. We going to program that? Or does Maryland National Capital Park and Planning program that? And who gets the money, baby? <laughs> the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission owns the property. Yes. Um, the, the, the correct name for the park. the park is the Tacoma Piney Branch uh, Neighborhood Park. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yes. And the pavilion is rented out by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So will we have classes that we, you know, we're going to go into skateboarding, are we? Uh, this possibly department, possibly. department head Clark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> possibly, you know, I, I you know when I first got here, you know, I had visions of a uh, uh, skateboard park tour. Yeah. Um, you know, because there are skateboard parks across the metropolitan region, and we have a lot of skate parker skateboarders uh, here in Tacoma Park. So that's still uh, something that I would like to do and take the kids to. And of course, we can start right here with our own skate park. And our, own, and our own director. Are you skateboarding? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> we won't embarrass you. I, I think that the, uh, you know, the city manager might not approve that. You know, work, work as cop. Yeah. And the other, the, the <laughs> matrix. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it the matrix where a, a youngster starts in an after-school program. You, may ha you have a different name for it than that. Mm -hmm. And then works their way towards being a junior counselor and then possibly going, being a career person. I, I heard you mention that to me, the, the thing when the council drew that, it, what do you call it? Integrated service delivery model. <laughs> That's easier to call it a matrix. All right. <laughs> That's too many words for me, but uh, I think I hear, heard you. I heard you mention that. To me, that was the most one of the most besides the goals. It was one of the most exciting parts of the of, of what the council actually directed the uh, recreation department to do. Um, and I also agree with Council Member Snipper and several of the of the people who've actually testified here. This is one department that could be a performance based department if we chose one section of of the recreation department, maybe not the whole department, but some place that would work for a performance base, set the goals and, and did we meet the goals uh, and if we didn't uh, what what happened why didn't we can we do it differently the next time i i mean it's it's the standard selling process of how many by when you know, I, I always say there's no power in saying we're going to get this done as soon as possible there's only power in saying it's going to happen by may the fifteenth you know we're going to have this we're going to show this by May the 15th. So, right. I, uh, great job on the budget. I, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, your basic cheerleader. I'm, the, uh, I'm a senior adult cheerleader here, but I, this is my field. You know, this, this, this is where my education is. And uh, I'm just thrilled to see this and see where the department's gone uh, over these last, these last wonderful five years, I think, that we've been together working. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Schultz. Um, have you ever thought uh, about creating a um, basketball program for retired people? I mean, the over 50 <laughs> basketball is probably beyond my comp competitive level, but the retiree <laughs> basketball league. You wouldn't you, need a very big gym. <laughs> yeah, you might have to lower the basket a few inches. But I, you know, I'm, but kidding aside, it, it, uh, 
it would be a, a fun opportunity to get out there and uh, get some exercise without having to compete too rigorously with people younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> we can uh, get yeah. Mr. Webster to do a workshop or something. Uh, yeah, and then get it started. Good. Yeah. And I will then uh, make my budget light shine brightly upon the recreation <laughs> department. Um, uh, I want to sort of put, it, put in a word here for John over at the rec center, John Webster, um, because that, that whenever I'm over there, which is not, you know, it's not that infrequently, because, you know, because I live right across the street, places uh, come, come in in the early evening, it's, it's throbbing with activity. And, you, and I've you know, met with some of your staff when I drop in. Um, it's, a, it's a very small little office, mostly full of storage of, of athletic gear and files. It's, uh, my heart goes out to anybody who has to work there five days a week because it's not, unlike the spaces in this building, um, not an ideal situation because you're right in the midst of all of your customers. There's no, there's no back room to retreat to in that facility. I wish that there were some way to sort of maybe put up a portable building where, where there could be a place for employees to retreat to and, uh, and have a little bit more room for storage and office space. But that's for another day. Something to think about, I think. Would you, uh, Greg, refresh my memory of when it was you began your position as director? February 2000. Oh, as director? I'm sorry. Yeah. January 3rd. January 3rd. So you've been in this position. Officially. Officially, right. And I know you were acting for a period of time while you were waiting for decisions to be made. I just want to say that I use that as, as a preface to a compliment um, to you what you've managed to put together uh, uh, in, in the brief period that you've had the authority to do so. Um, here we are, what, just four months on, on the job for you as, as director. Uh, I think the budget that you've got here is very responsive, I think, to the, the last, the prior city council's very earnest efforts to, to uh, shift the focus and the mission of the rec department. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I did have questions about the implementation of the integrated service delivery model, but you've already answered those because of the other questions. Um, and I know that the prior council, we put you through, or, and the staff of the rec department sort of through a meat grinder in, in 2011 because and created a lot of uncertainty because of the qu kinds of questions and the as we worked through what we thought our vision should be of it and it wasn't always clear to us until we kind of got done what it was going to turn out and I know it was hard on the staff and then you add in the fact that uh, you've had some turnover just natural turnover in staff uh, when do you think you'll be getting back full staffing what's your hope on that well I'm anticip anticipating uh, sometime this summer uh, we've uh, offered a position um, which uh, hasn't been um, we're, we're anticipating filling really soon um, one of the positions uh, because it, it, it I would like to get the input input from the assistant director uh, on the job um, because that will be a position that they directly supervise. So, I see. you know, I don't want to just go and hire Right, uh, so it someone. needs to be a staged Yes, yes. Process. So I anticipate uh, filling two of those vacancies uh, prior to summer and mm -hmm. one uh, during uh, the middle of summer. Good. Um, I appreciate your putting together this uh, uh, matrix on the uh, Recreation Department revenue, particularly because it covers... Uh, seven fiscal years um, I noticed uh, and, uh, the, and you, I guess you did that because of my, my request or earlier today and I think it's extremely helpful that since FY07 to 
the requested FY13 that the fee revenue will have increased about 26 percent, and uh, particularly in the uh, seen, and I'm put saying this, even though we here see these numbers, the people in the on who are looking out there don't have access, but uh, uh, community programs have gone from about 16,000 dollars a year up to uh, 61,000 um, and uh, camps have gone from have um, were back in 2007 were pretty much close to what they are now but for a period of years they dropped considerably and now they're back up to where they were and the before and after school budget uh, rev budgeted revenues seem to have about doubled since since that time one of the questions that I and I think that's great and I uh, but if, if you've seen any problems of trying to raise fees understanding that you know you part of setting a price is at least in the commercial world is you set the price based on what you think the market will bear and this isn't a commercial enterprise but nevertheless that's part of the equation is that you want to raise fees to a certain level, but yet you don't want to deter anybody uh, or as few as possible from participating uh, the, the, uh, in, in the programs. And I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts are in that area as you've tried to make adjustments for this fiscal year and thinking forward into future fiscal years. Um, how you f how you feel about that? You know, in this uh, with the pre pre presentation of this budget, um, you know, we really as a staff concentrated on um, trying to find alternative ways to uh, um, increase our revenues. Um, I really did not want to increase the fees for. Um, a few some of our major programs because they just went through a fee increase um, the previous year mm -hmm. um, while those programs are are thriving and, and, and really doing well and um, you know we're able to do a lot you know with the uh, uh, our after school program for example you know we're bringing in uh, Mr. McAllister um, you know we were able to identify some areas where you know we can save um, and maximize the use of the city's dollar um, that we're actually spending on that program. You know, I believe that I reported a decrease um, uh, in um, in the after school area and the expenditures because we're going to use more uh, of the talents of the city staff right. uh, versus utilizing contractors uh, for that program. Um, we're going to, you know, the contractors that we do use, uh, we're going to keep more of that revenue that we do bring in because those will all be new contractors. Uh, we're going to get a higher percentage um, of revenue from those uh, contractors. You know, in that program, we're adding, um, you know, new clubs, um, and we're going to have our after after school program sort of mimic our our summer program with with uh, special interest uh, workshops and classes that uh, parents can register their kids for. So not only do you get uh, uh, before or not only do you get an aftercare program. But you'll be able to learn the skill or, or participate in the skill building acti activities. Um, you know, so we, we're, we're thinking of innovative ways to, to 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 gain more revenue without really raising the price this year mm -hmm. uh, for those larger programs. For some of the smaller programs, um, you know, that we have that you know we we've taken a look at. Um, you know, there'll there'll be uh, you know incremental increases. Um, you know, something small. Um, you know, because we do want to remain affordable uh, so that the majority of the city residents can partake if they would like. Um, and we want to uh, market, really market our, uh, our, uh, um, our fee uh, scholarship program. 
uh, to residents so that those residents, that, to let them know that even though, you know, you may not be able to afford it at this price, we do have options for you to be able to participate. Um, you know, so this way, you know, this year we really focused on alternative ways um, without raising revenue and the majority of our programs. Um, but we will be taking a look at our, all of our fees uh, throughout the next year to find out, you know, other ways to maximize revenue without pricing ourselves out of the market. You know, I, I believe as a as a, uh, a, a city service, you know, I, I, that we should be affordable and people should uh, be able to come um, and and enjoy, uh, you know, without you know breaking their bank. So, yeah, I worked. I worked on the uh, served on the board of directors of the downtown YMCA for about four years, uh, and that that was you, know, you have a nonprofit in downtown on Rhode Island Avenue, and within a half mile walking distance, there were probably about thirty competing private mm -hmm. uh, athletic and rec uh, you know, fitness facilities, and it was that same sort of thing: is that how do you maintain the spirit? of the YMCA uh, but still be able to compete against the clubs that could offer far more uh, niceties. One last question that I, that I have. Uh, one of the mandates I think we set up, the council did last year, was to make an adjustment in the fees for residents, between residents and non-residents, realizing that there's some programs where you just cannot do that. But I'm wondering, where does that stand in terms of implementation? Well, um, as a department, we do have, um, we currently have a um, price differential for residents versus non-residents. Um, that, as far as taking a look at that and whether or not to increase the margin mm -hmm. um, that residents pay versus non-residents, we haven't taking a look at that mm -hmm. as of yet, right. um, but this will be something that will take place um, in phase two of the implementing the new, new vision. You know, we couldn't, you know, I tried to take a look at, you know, things that were in the vision that we can do um, immediately and that will have the, uh, the, the, the lowest effect on, you know, the staff and the current operations um, and try to get those things implemented. Um, of course, with being down three staff, you know, that was kind of tough mm -hmm. in trying to really manage and figure out, you know, what we can actually do uh, with the resources that we have. Um, but, you know, we'll, I'll work with the rec Recreation yeah. Committee on the rest of the, okay. the objectives uh, throughout the course of uh, the year. Um, sure. And, and we'll come up with a uh, strategic way to uh, implement the, uh, the, the difference in well, the and, variance and, and in fees. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. I realize that the, the, it's really kind of premature to even ask you some of these questions because this is, as you said, this is like step one of the integrated service delivery model and a lot of these other fee adjustments and stuff like that. Uh, and you've been doing this under kind of a pressure cooker kind of a situation. Uh, and I, I, so I'm just would say I appreciate what you've accomplished here. And I'm looking forward uh, to seeing the progress that you make uh, you know, by this time next year. I I'm sure you are too. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I think that gets us to the end of our recreation discussion. One no, 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 you don't get to. And we're going to take a short break. Moving to the communications budget. I believe the deputy city manager has joined us for this item. That's right. One of the advantages of being the deputy city manager is I get to take it for the team by carrying the last two items this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to present the communication budget for fiscal year 2013. The uh, communications division oversees uh, and comprises City TV, the website, the newsletter, social media, and also our relationships with uh, media and marketing. 
Uh, the communications division uh, section uh, has our budget. Uh, our budget for this proposed budget for fiscal year 2013 um, is $344,979. Uh, it represents an increase of 8% compared to budget expenditure, expenditures for the prior fiscal year. Uh, there's a couple small changes here. Um, the personnel related expenditures represent approximately 50% of the budget. The full-time staffing stays the same. One of the things that's different that's reflected in this budget is we had thought we would be moving a number of part-time staff to contract. Now we're going to kind of split that uh, as we've uh, kind of learned how, how it works best. And I, so you'll see uh, a little greater increase under personnel than we had thought there would be this past year uh, and a little less expenditures of contract dollars on that. Uh, supplies constitute 5% of departmental in expenditures. Uh, one new uh, addition is an allocation of $15,000. It's probably going to be about a standard amount per year for replacement of our cameras, lights, um, little parts that are no longer under warranty uh, but aren't a significant enough change to constitute what we would pay out of the cable uh, capital funds. And um, and that's something that I think we're going to be having as an ongoing expense. The services and charges account for about 36% of the budget. Um, the expenditures are about the same uh, with the little switch about the contractual costs versus personnel costs. Uh, we do have $5,000 more uh, for assistance on our website development and hosting. The um, we don't really change in terms of our staff. Um, we have been working very hard on the website. We received uh, questions from Councilmember Schultz um, by email, and um, I will respond in writing. It's a little late um, tonight to go through many of these things, but I'll, I'll just address a couple kind of overarching uh, thoughts about the website. The first thing is that. Um, We've had, obviously we've been wanting to get the new website running as quickly as possible. Um, we're working really hard on that. The structure of that website is essentially established. We're working on content and tweaking. Um, we have a real problem with our old current website. And I think the description of it that I can best uh, use is it's very much like the house of a hoarder. Uh, everybody threw stuff in there. Some of the stuff's important. Uh, there's no organization and there's tons of stuff. And the, the excavation work that we have done uh, is, is daunting. Um, the, and that has, spent, that has taken a, a, a lot of time. Um, we also have the problem that you're familiar with just in terms of um, managers time on getting some of the content approved. And frankly, right now, I'm probably the holdup. Um, and, um, you know, working as hard as I can. I'm hoping over the next uh, three weeks to uh, expedite the final approval of, of a good amount of content that, is, that has been submitted. Um, I'll go ahead and send out that information by email. Um, but if there's some specific question, I can, certainly can address that this evening. With um, the uh, newsletter, we're going to stick to pretty much the same um, uh, newsletter process that we have right now. As we get finished up with the website, um, that's something that we'll be looking at, um, you know, what kinds of uh, changes or things we may want to do with that. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, f final kind of point that I'd like to mention is in looking at how we use media, we think of the new website really as almost a static resource reference tool for people trying to get services, get information from the city with the, uh, some news information um, as, uh, and calendar information that's kept up to date uh, and fresh. Um, things that are like the more friendly side of us uh, come through with the social media and uh, to some extent also with a newsletter. And so we're looking at how, we, how each of these comes up with a, a whole complement of um, communication, 
both outlet and, and input for, for us as a city. The one advantage that we have with the current website and with the new one um, is the analytic research that we can do in terms of you know, what people are looking for and, and how we tailor that information. And I think that that's already been enormously um, helpful. Um, the uh, final item I wanted to mention, we do have a couple capital items uh, that have been men mentioned from primarily from the IT division, uh, the fiber connectivity with the um, uh, public works facility and some video conferencing, uh, both elements which would be paid out of the cable capital uh, grant program. The uh, other kinds of improvements and expenditures um, that we have budgeted, we've gone through a full analysis of everything related to city TV in terms of every, <laughs> we have a very um, helpful document even with photographs of the various uh, pieces of equipment, how long it will take before they'll need to be replaced or upgraded and that's uh, shown on the capital worksheet. Um, and I've got that even for small items that don't kind of go up to the level of capital, but I think we've been trying to be very systematic about how we keep the system working well and identifying whether it's operating or grant funds that need to go um, to improve it. With that, I think I'll turn it over to you for questions. And uh, I've got plenty of information, but I think uh, <laughs> given the lateness of the hour, I'll try to um, just answer your questions. Darn, there's lights on. I was going to try and use Council President Berliner's trick of saying, oh, there's no questions, there's no lights. Oh, I didn't turn the light board on. <laughs> Council Member Snipper. Did I get first? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, of course, we expressed our dissatisfaction with the website process yes. um, on prior occasions, so I, I won't repeat that. Um, if I might, uh, uh, if it's at all possible, I want you to know that staff is more upset that the website's not up than even you. So <laughs> uh, the the level of concern and interest in this is very high among staff. And I appreciate and I wish we had had it going right now. Um, <clears throat> we all wish it was going, going right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I do want to say <clears throat> publicly that I, um, it's something I do during on my day job, as it were, so I'm pretty familiar with the difficulties of um, redesigning a website and um, the level of staffing that are required to make it happen <clears throat> is, is always surprisingly high. And I hope that, uh, what I would, would like to say is I hope going forward that um, <clears throat> the city will recognize that um, this isn't a place that we're going to be able to save um, money or resources, that the public demands for um, uh, social media interaction, for a uh, more uh, frequently updated website, easier to use website with more facilities on it, those demands are only going to increase. Right. And <clears throat> pretty substantially because, in essence, there's a kind of competition going on uh, among municipal governments and the public um, demands for this um, are going along with it. Mm -hmm. That's right. um, we will need to look into, um, you know, the Tacoma Park app. I see mm -hmm. coming soon. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> and, oh, and we've so got on. wonderful ideas for that. I'm can't wait to these, get to the point where we these, do that. These kind, right. These kinds of things are just going to burst forth. Um, and they are both uh, great opportunities and, um, you know, tremendous responsibilities, but they will take additional staff. It's just not, just can't be done with existing staff. It's basically the, the message. Um, and <clears throat> the council will have to, um, you know, decide how to pay for it. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Councilmember Schultz. The techno whiz of the council. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Show us your new phone. Yeah. No. I won't cut it. I haven't got it to work right yet. Um, I'm curious about one thing. Um, 
on the f social media account under your performance measures? We've, we, unfortunately, we've already, or fortunately, we've already exceeded what we had estimated for this year. So, uh, social media account followers. Mm -hmm. It says uh, it's for Facebook and Twitter that estimated for this year is 800 followers, and that's down from a thousand. Or no, I'm sorry, I'm looking backwards. That'll expect it to go up to a thousand. I'm not a Facebook follower mm -hmm. user, but so I'm just curious uh, when you consider the size of the city and the number of people who use Facebook, it seems to be omnipresent these mm -hmm. days. Is 800 or a thousand uh, a number that makes sense, or am I just not getting it? I, mean, I, I would think the number would be higher than that. Or well, I think it's actually, um, it, I mean, it's already over a thousand mm -hmm. um, okay. in actuality, just since the time we, we put forward, put the budget together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, we have lots of people who just come in and look for a bit and do different things with it. I think it's going to increase tremendously. Um, there's some folks, we've, we've especially got an older female followership that's very strong, uh, oh. which is interesting. So there's some things that, you know, different <laughs> pockets of people kind of get involved in, in topics that over time. Um, as different events happen in Tacoma Park, a whole different demographic comes in, and that's something we're looking at. Um, the Twitter account's really quite interesting in terms of um, how many people retweet our things, uh, but we're also followed heavily by media through Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the ways that we get people to come to our events or cover our events is, uh, or hear our news or whatever um, comes through those avenues. So even though it might be uh, one reporter coming out because he saw some tweet, he, you know, that news then gets out all over the place. Um, I think it's going to continue to expand. That these aren't the only kinds of social media that we're involved with, or, mm -hmm. uh, and there will be more and more um, as things happen. Um, as Councilmember Snipper said, I mean, you can you can devote an awful lot of attention to these things, and the real emphasis right now is on the new website. So part of this is is having that kind of flavor, the arts edge, whatever, that we can do that's a friendly thing with the social mm -hmm. media. Um, but a lot of the real work will come after a little bit. Okay. Uh, two more questions. One, it says, uh, the text says, staff also produces original magazine and talk shows that highlight community activities, mm -hmm. issues, and organizations. How do, uh, and maybe you don't know the answer, maybe this is something that Abel needs to respond to. Uh, how do you go about advertising or, or attracting people to these original programming or, or knowing about it? There's a couple different ways. Um, certainly when there's a, an arts group comes in and does a performance here, for example, and their city TV staff covers it and, it, um, and it's available on the web, um, we also um, have been formatting it and sending it to YouTube. The people who are the actors, they send it to their friends or their listservs, their followers, um, and we send out a tweet or two, and all of a sudden lots of people can come and, and look at it. Mm -hmm. And um, on some of them, we get very high viewership. Uh, again, that's something that, you know, we can really work on a marketing scheme um, yeah. at a later time. Clearly, it's something I don't appreciate because I just yeah. am not, I'm not into the social media thing. Um, when uh, the other question is, is when do you think we as a city council will be able to have a, a first look at the sort of the beta version, if you will, of the, of website? the, of the website? You know, my guess, a, is a, my guess is a, a in, just a few, in just a couple of weeks. I mean, we're very close. I'd like to have the content uh, be a number of the things that you would be interested in. So you could say, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I thought it would be or that's right. what I have in mind. Um, and I think that... Um, you know, we've already got the structure for the pages and, and much of the overall formatting so that uh, when you'll see something, then you'll say, oh, yeah, I can see how that, how that works on these various pages. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
Okay, we'll move along to the last item, uh, program open space funding. All right. Uh, the program open space um, annual program um, is something that the city council needs to set each year and especially for those new council members who've not been through the the POS uh, process before I just wanted to uh, let you know about it and it is appropriate for budget season to talk about um, the state has a, has through its Department of Natural Resources has grant funding called program open space for recreation um, facilities and for parks, uh, park land acquisition, that kind of thing. Um, it's primarily a purchase land or develop a park kind of thing. It's not to be used for regular ongoing expenses. The money from the state comes to, in our case, Montgomery County through uh, park and planning. Um, we get a certain allocation each year. It can be zero or it can be several hundred thousand dollars. Sometimes we, we really don't know and it's a surprise. Um, what we do with that is identify the kinds of parks programs that we're interested in having these funds uh, be allocated to and uh, submit that information through Montgomery County to the state. The uh, program open space funds pay normally 75% of the cost uh, of the project and the city or other non-state funds need to match the 25 percent. The um, last year there was kind of more money in our account than we could figure out. I still don't know the answer. I have not pushed the limits on that. But I have confirmed that there's um, a little over $300,000 in the account. Um, it may be 319 instead of 316. They're, they're looking at, uh, at a small item. But in the event, uh, we have a substantial amount of money in the account. We should be identifying ways to spend a good portion of that in the near future uh, because if you sit around with money in the pocket, somebody else um, wants to use it, and we, we don't need to do that. Um, the um, City Council last year had adopted an annual program that was to install a uh, sprinkler system for the Ziegler Field um, at a cost of about $60,000 and the rest uh, to a potential acquisition and development project at Sligo Mill Poplar Mill Natural Area. And the proposal at that time, there was a, there's a house um, adjacent to the park that had been for sale. Um, if we had purchased it and sold off a portion and we could have built a little parking area, um, we weren't, that house has been sold and it's not an opportunity that we can pursue. One of the things that I had really wanted to spend the money on was to um, do a massive cleanup of the invasives in that. Um, that is not an allowable use of the funds unless it's part of a development project. Um, so that, that was uh, unfortunate. Um, however, there are a couple um, projects that um, in talking with the Director of Recreation and Director of Public Works uh, uh, we'd like to put forward and I have some information on a couple other on at least one other item as well. Um, there is an interest, um, first of all, the uh, Recreation Department no longer wishes to install sprinklers at Ziegler Field. Um, they have kind of made the decision that that's not the field that needs it. Um, what they would like to do is to replace the sprinkler system at Lee Jordan Field next to Tacoma Park Middle School. And uh, the cost of that project uh, would be about $80,000, of which $60,000 would be POS funds uh, and 20,000 city funds. Uh, there's also an interest in building a new equipment shed at Edwell Hill Field. This is uh, something that houses the uh, baseball and soccer equipment um, with the new play, um, Tacoma Piney Branch Park improvements. Uh, the cost of that shed, or it's actually a nicer building now, is proposed, uh, is thirteen thousand uh, dollars. The sports league will, um, sport league, sport leagues will contribute five thousand dollars, as will park and planning, leaving a balance of three thousand um, dollars. Another um, park. Most of our parks that have play equipment um, have had the improvements paid for with POS funds. Uh, Colby Avenue, the Colby Park, Colby Avenue Park was done with PLS funds many years ago and it's time to have that 
uh, equipment uh, redone. The renovation design work is estimated uh, to cost $28,000 uh, for, uh, for this year, uh, FY13. $21,000 of that would be from POS funds, $7,000 from the city. And then the completion and the actual construction of the work for Colby Avenue Park would be uh, next fiscal year at a cost of about $150,000. Uh, the majority, again, would be paid with POS funds. Um, the next park that's kind of on the list is Spring Park, although there's, that doesn't need to be done this, you know, quite so soon, but that's kind of on the list of uh, when the parks are about ready um, to be done. I know that um, Council Member da uh, Daniels Cohen had expressed interest in a tot lot at, the Orchard, at Orchard Avenue Park. <coughs> Orchard Avenue Park is currently a community gardens. It's owned by Park and Planning. Um, and there is um, room for a tot lot. It's certainly, it was proposed to have a tot lot and a basketball court when the, land, when the land was purchased by Park and Planning at the city's request. The, um, I've had a brief conversation with a person at Park and Planning who believes that there's a good likelihood that we could partner on the project for a tot lot where some of our POS funds could be uh, used for that improvement. Um, I'm to follow up if there's interest in that. I'm to follow up with her uh, sometime this week. Um, what I'd like to know from you is if there are other parks or recreation kinds of um, development projects or acquisitions that the council's interested in, we would need to come back in May with a program open space resolution of the annual program and then send that information in um, for inclusion. I believe we've budgeted the funds, uh, but this would be how we spend the, the POS funds uh, in the coming year. And I'm open for your ideas. Um, I'll check with Council Member Mail in a minute. Uh, what I want to do first is see if you can give us any additional information on the uh, sprinklers, just because my recollection is that the ones on the uh, uh, Wilhelm Field haven't been there that long. Is there some particular issue why? You mean Lee Jordan? No, Lee, Lee Jordan uh, Lee is the oh. one. Lee Jordan next to the middle school is the okay. one that wants to be, that they wish okay. to so, replace. So it's not the Ed Wilhelm Field okay. sprinklers. Okay, okay. That's, that makes more sense. And frankly, if something's wrong with them, then Park and Planning is supposed to fix them because of the impact of the construction. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Uh, Council Member Mayo, do you have any questions on this here? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess for me, um, and I think I've suggested it, uh, in terms of the sort of um, reconciliation items, I'd like to see more of a balance between between um, maintenance and new features and then acquisition. Um, and I note that our strategic plan talks about, you know, areas of park in the city and and, uh, uh, and that being fairly stagnant for a number of years. So I'd really like to see us look at um, potential new acquisitions. One that I've sort of uh, thrown out as an idea to my constituents and gotten a fairly positive feedback on was the idea of acquisition of the lot, the vacant lot that's paved at the corner of Jackson and, and 410, um, which was sold and sold to an individual who lives in Silver Spring for roughly $300,000, oh, sorry, roughly $190,000 um, in 2007, I believe. So, you know, that's an example of a site um, that if it were a park space, it would be a, a, a wonderful sort of welcome space uh, coming in to, for people coming into Tacoma Park along 410. I'm sure there are other sites as well, but I, yeah, I really like the idea of us preserving some portion of this money for uh, for new acquisition and for um, you know, for really new things. For, for that same reason, I appreciate the, the Colby Park renovation design work um, because I imagine that would result in a, a real change in the service, the look and feel of the facility. Um, whereas I'm, uh, you know, just sort of less inclined uh, toward the equipment shed as, as uh, you know, really what this money is intended for. And if I could just get a sense uh, and a follow-up to that question, if staff feels that there's a, uh, a balance or an imbalance on the uh, acquisition versus maintenance issue, what I'm thinking of particularly is that uh, if we acquire more, then that adds to the maintenance schedule. And wondering, 
what your sense is of where we are on keeping up with the maintenance on the ones we've got? Well, I mean, I think um, we've, in the past few years, we've primarily used, in the past, I guess, 15 years, we've primarily used the funds for acquisition of natural areas, like Sligo Mill, Poplar Mill, you know, some of the other areas where, where we just wanted to prevent them from being developed. Um, the, we have not used them to create new developed parks much. Um, the, um, the one that was in, on Orchard Avenue was specifically identified as a developed type of park, an active park, because the neighborhood does not have an active park in that area. It's one of the areas that is underserved in terms of active parks. Um, the creation of new park land does require us to maintain it. Um, the cost of maintenance really depends on the site and, and what's involved. It may not be very much. Uh, you know, once we get Sligo Poplar Mill under control, it wouldn't cost that much. But um, I think it's, it's one of those it's, acquisition is a valid use of these funds, and it's up to the council if that's what they want to do. I think it's, it's uh, a, you know, it's an encouraged use. I'm also thinking about places like uh, Circle Woods and whether there are issues there about uh, kind of it's it's not an active use park but questions I guess kind of like with like on Poplar Mill about uh, invasives and kind of a different type of maintenance right it's it's a it can be a burden on the city's budget there's no there's no question that there's um, a responsibility of you know keeping out the trash and dumping Cleaning out invasives, you know, making it and continue to have it as a as a nice natural area, um, but that's you know that's part of the discussion. I think. Right. It's so it might be helpful uh, before we come back to this to have at least uh, a kind of a matrix of uh, what what we what we currently have with a, even just a category of maintenance. Okay, I can look at a little bit of that. Uh, the, um, a lot of this was not in terms of the cost of maintenance, but a lot of in terms of the balance was looked at in the master planning process and in some of our open space inventories um, in terms of um, kind of the, I, I can get, I think, some sense from our public works department about the, the amount of um, money that might be required for different kinds of parks. Yeah, just because I think if we're going to, if we're going to think about including purchase of other space, it's good to go in with our eyes open. Sure. Uh, Council Member Schultz. Um, in terms of the, uh, I just have a question. Thanks. Uh, the uh, program open space money, can that be used could, could, will it be able to be used if, uh, someday when we attempt to acquire from Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission the rec center land and building? I know that's there's nothing official, but that's sort of been a, a hope mm -hmm. to work out some kind of a land swap. Sure, I mean, it's a recreational but, facility. But could, could open space money be used, state open space money be used to that kind of... Uh, to, to defray those capital costs? I believe so, as long as there's a recreation use intended for the facility. There may be some other constraints. I'm not sure. Barb, do you have a comment? I have not talked to anyone recently, but it, probably going back several years ago, I think park and planning would probably hand the building over, mainly because, <laughs> truthfully, it, it's going to be in need of major, major capital repairs yes. in the near future. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I, I see the city probably having to pay park and planning to acquire it. It's the work the on the building that would be the bigger a considerable issue. amount of money to get the building and the roof and some other things. And yeah, well, if, if we renovated it or just tore it down and build a new building, would POS money be applicable in that situation? It would. I mean, obviously, yeah. there. Yes, that would be used. Okay. For, That's all I really for. wanted to know. Thank you. That's sure. good to know. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's actually a city council meeting recording. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> what city? <laughs> it's Common Park. There you go. Oh, that—that that was while we were on break. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Councilmember Daniel Scone. And I, I have a question about another park that's a, it's a Maryland National Capital Park and Planning uh, facility, mm -hmm. yet for some reason they've forgotten that it exists. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Opal Daniels mm -hmm. Park. Is there any way we could e This is all about just acquiring land, or could we also acquire new equipment? Because it was established in 1988, and no one, there's not one bit of lick of equipment that's been replaced or repaired since then. Yes, POS funds is appropriately used for equipment. What I would, though, say, both with Orchard Avenue Park and, and certainly with Opal Daniels, um, is that it is the responsibility of park and planning to do that work. And one of the things that we may not have done as a city is um, pushed hard enough on our um, testimony with their CIP process. Um, as to where Opal Daniels stands in that. And I would like to go back and look and see because, I mean, they're supposed to be paying for it and they're supposed to be fixing it. Well, I know the community actually does all the invasives and cleans up the trash mm -hmm. uh, twice a year uh, in that particular park. And a year and a half ago we went to a meeting with Park and Planning and they said they were going to renovate all of the equipment last summer, but I'm not holding my breath because it, there's no Then it may on. be very soon in the CIP. I think it's something that we need to look Can at. Can you look into it? Sure. That would be so swell. Thank you. Thank you. And the tot lot, the tot lot in, um, in the Pinecrest area, just please press forward on that. I mean, that's on my list. Okay. We'll, we'll, ha we'll have a tot lot somehow. So it sounds like we'll come back to this, make some adjustments, have some additional information. Yes, and, and I may do it by email primarily at first, and I'd, I'd encourage you, if you have other ideas, to let me know so that when we come back, um, I, I can just bring forward a draft annual program for you to consider. I think that, that would move things along well, unless there's an issue that you really feel like you need to talk out. And other ideas sooner, not right before. <laughs> Always sooner, yeah. sure. Thank you. Okay. I was just glad to know what this is. This is pretty interesting. And the final thing I'll note, I forgot I had promised that I would mention uh, something that's coming up this weekend, and I forgot to at the beginning at Council Comments. So rather than just skipping it completely, I'll mention that uh, there's supposedly a very good program coming up this Saturday night, May 5th at 7.30 here in this room. Uh, suggested donation $15, $10 for seniors and students, and this is La Rondinella. The, uh, it's a uh, program of Sephardic songs highlighting Jewish history, and uh, it promises to be quite interesting. And I promised... Uh, What's the date again? Uh, Cinco de Mayo. Huh? <laughs> Which in Silver Spring is being celebrated on the board. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we are adjourned. I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs>